So hey guys welcome back to the channel. This is a story about what if Kakashi adopted Naruto in the Chunin exams. Part 2. If you guys enjoy this what if. And if you want to part 3. Comment down below. And let me know before I start please do support for more awesome content. And leave a like and don't forget to subscribe to my channel. And also share this video with your friends. And check out the description. And check out my playlist. So let's start the video. Chapter 6, Cloudy, with a chance of exams. It had been two months since they had brought back Sanadi. A few days later she had cleaned up the hospital after taking over as the director. She had also officially taken Hinata as her student. It seemed that Hinata had a real talent for healing. She had also taken a few lessons from Kurenai-sensei in the art of Jinjutsu. Hinoda had begun to train her in the art of Bajutsu. Oddly enough, no one argued about that. It was the same with Naruto learning from Shinjutsu. The weapons were oddly quite skilled teachers. Hinoda had also shortened herself to suit Hinata's fighting style better. The sentient staff had shortened from 2 meters to a little longer than a meter. For reference, Hinoda was originally 7 feet, so over 2 meters. She shrunk to 4 feet, so Hinoda is now a little longer than a meter. Thanks to the training, Hinata had come out of her shell and no longer wore her coat. She now wore a light lavender sleeveless kimono-style blouse with vertical lines, with a dark purple obi around her. She also wore dark blue shorts and black stockings. To finish the look was a pair of open toed black high-heeled boots. She kept her hit IA tight around her forehead to hide the fact the seal had been removed. Yeah, basically her outfit from Naruto the last except with her hit IA around her forehead, I feel it's fitting for how confident she's become. She had to keep up the fact that the seal was still on her forehead. Not only did it protect her from the Hayuga clan trying anything on her. But it also protected her from any shinobi that might be interested in the Byakugan, Kafarachimaru cough, no one would target a banished Hayuga for their Byakugan. The moment said eyes were to be removed, they would be destroyed. Not only that but on her death the eyes would be sealed away. Not to mention any children she had with a non-Hayuga clan member would be born without the Byakugan. All this was common knowledge, the Hayuga clan had leaked years ago. Not to mention what happened to that one Hayuga clan member who was banished and kidnapped by enemy shinobi. The enemy shinobi learned the hard way what happened to the Byakugan of a banished Hayuga. Of course this would all be true if she hadn't had the seal removed thanks to her father. Thus why she kept up the charade. Shortly after returning, Jiraiya was inaugurated as the. That day had actually been quite fun. It also resulted in a couple unexpected people being chased by women. Two days before Jiraiya was set to be inaugurated they learned something about Naruto's Mavasid. They learned that somehow Naruto had managed to create a whole new technique from the E-class. This new ninjutsu was easily an air rank. The new transformation couldn't be seen through by the Byakugan. It was also impossible to dispel with a hit. Jirei would later find a use for said technique, this would lead to the inauguration day incident. Poor Kakashi and Ibisu. Shortly after he was inaugurated, Jirei took a look at the former Gen in Yakumo Kurama's seal. He found it was faulty and close to breaking, he fixed it, making the seal better and allowing her to fulfill her dream. But she would need to recover a bit first. My guy began to teach her Aikido. Meanwhile Tsunade has her put on a special diet to help rebuild her muscle mass. Well Kurenai began to tutor her again after she got Ikumo's forgiveness. It was currently night and Sasuke was waiting outside of his house. Over his back was a travel pack full of sealing scrolls. Inside them were supplies and scrolls. He was waiting for both Sakura so they could head to the rendezvous point to meet up with the ones who would take them to Orochimaru. Just like they planned. Flashback, a week ago. Sasuke and Sakura were training in their usual spot. It had gotten late, and Sakura would soon be heading home. Little did the two know, they were being watched by four shinobi from another village. Their job is to contact Sasuke Ichiha and convince him to come with them. Their second objective was to recruit Sakura Hiruno, who it had been confirmed that Sasuke was training with as a combo partner. Her disability wouldn't be a problem at all. Hirachimaru-sama could easily fix it. It was at that moment that Seiken and Teaya dropped into the clearing. Seiken was a man with pale skin and blue-gray hair. Behind his head was something covered in his hair. Teaya was a woman with fair skin and red hair. They were both wearing similar outfits composed of beige-colored sleeveless tunic with a purple rope-like belt. The two former genin turned ready to fight when they saw the pair. Seiken grinned as he stepped forward and said. Hello you two, I'm Seiken, and she's Teaya. You know, you're pretty good for a crippled former genin and a genin who's holding back so much. Why haven't you embraced Arachimaru-sama's gift yet, Sasuke? Sasuke grit, he had managed to feel the power of the curse mark during the invasion. But he hadn't been able to call on it since. The damn seal was restraining it. Seiken grinned as he leaned forward. You know, what you felt is only a taste of what that gift can give you. But that's not all, Arachimaru-sama can fix your friend's leg. Sakura growled as she said. 
Arachimaru was the one who broke it in the first place. Aya scoffed as she said. Oh the only reason you're crippled like that bitch is because you thought being a shinobi on a diet was a good fucking idea. You had no fucking muscle mass. Your chakra would have sped up your healing and kept you from getting crippled if you had the energy. That was the stupidest idea out there. Only reason you're even able to recover as much as you did is because you stopped your bitching and started taking it seriously. Seiken held up his hand, making Taya quiet down. Well my companion's words were vulgar, she does have a point. Not to mention, if you join him, Arachimaru would be more than willing to heal you. With his help, you two could achieve your dreams. The two of them froze. They couldn't deny that what Seiken said was enticing. But before they could give an answer Seiken continued speaking. You don't have to decide now. You have a week to decide, we will be waiting in this training ground a week from now for your answer. But those words, Seiken and Tei left the clearing, Sasuke and Sakura never saw the other two. Sakura looked at Sasuke as the Achiha began to grin. Sakura, we're going, it's just what we need to reach our goals. Sakura looked at Sasuke for a few moments before she nodded. She wouldn't leave him alone. She would walk beside him as they got revenge on those who wronged them starting with Itachi who slaughtered Sasuke's family, then Naruto, and then the rest. Anyone who got in their way would die. No matter who they are. Then after that was done, the two of them would rebuild the Achiha clan together. Present day. Sakura soon arrived with her bag packed. Sasuke looked at her as he said. Are you ready to go, Sakura? The pink-haired girl nodded as she said. Yes, let's go. There's no more reason to stay here. They turned and left, unaware that they were being followed by a pair of shadows. They soon arrived at the training where they met the two sound shinobi. When they arrived they found the two shinobi they had met before, along with two more. One was a dark-skinned man with six arms, the other was a large man with fair skin and an orange mohawk with two side tufts. They were both wearing similar outfits to the man and woman from before. Seiken grinned as he said. I assume you two have decided to take us up on our offer. Sasuke nodded. Yes, now how are we getting out of the village? Before they could continue speaking the dark-skinned man frowned and seemed to tug on something in midair. When he did, two people wrapped in what looked like golden silk were dragged into the clearing. Seiken, these two were following them. They ran into my traps. Seiken looked at the two. Good job Kitamaru. Sakura gasped when she saw her parents, before her eyes narrowed and spoke in the ice-cold tone she had started to use after being attacked. Why did you two follow me? Babuki spoke up. Sweetie, we've been worried. You've become so cold. When we saw you sneaking out tonight with a bag, we were worried. Hizashi had been analyzing the situation before he spoke up. These shinobi are from Itagakur. You're defecting aren't you Sakura? Let it be said, even though he never progressed past Genin, Kizashi was still sharp as a kunai. Hidemaru laughed as he said. Yep, those two were quite smart and accepted Arachimaru-sama's generous offer. But Yuki focused on Sakura. Sakura, don't do this. Please, don't throw your life away because of the Achiha. You have a dot she wasn't able to keep speaking as a kunai had found its way into her throat. The one who had thrown said kunai was Sakura. Sakura looked at her dying mother, her eyes as cold as ice. She chuckled as she said. Don't throw my life away, but mom you're the one who told me to chase my dreams. Well mommy, my dream is to get revenge on all those who have wronged me and Sasuke-kun. Bizashi was forced to watch as his wife died, choking on her own blood. He turned and glared at Sakura as he said. I assume I'm next Sakura. He shook his head as he said. Sweetie, you don't have to do this. You know this will stay with you forever. I just hope that one day ugh. Kizashi was unable to finish talking as Sakura had thrown a kunai into his throat as well. Sakura grinned a slightly insane smile as she said to her dying father. Of course I have to do this daddy, it's what I was meant for. For those who haven't realized, yes Sakura is a complete yandir. But Akinda matches up with the Sasuke in this story, who's completely unhinged and will happily kill everyone he sees as an obstacle. Sakura turned to the sound four as she said. I'm ready to go, what about you Sasuke-kun? Sasuke nodded, turning to the sound four. Let's go already. Next time I see this village, it will be when I burn it to the ground. Hidemaru chuckled as he said. I like these two Seiken, they're my kind of people. With those words he pulled back all his threads, he couldn't leave them behind without hinting they were here. Aya spoke up. Fucking good for you Kitamaru, can we go now? The large man sighed. A lady really shouldn't curse Aya so much. Oh fuck off your robo. Seiken glared at the two. Be quiet. He then turned to Sasuke and Sakura before pulling out a scroll. Arachimaru Sam sent us supplies to begin your treatments. He unsealed a massive barrel, a bottle of pills, and a syringe. He pointed to the barrel. This is what we will be transporting you two in. It has two chambers, you both will be in one. He holds up the syringe. 
If this is the compound for the curse seal, we will inject Sakura with it. She will then be stored in her chamber. The curse seal will heal the damage done to her leg, as well as making her stronger. He held up the bottle of pills. These are mind awakening pills. It will allow the curse seal to escape the seal and advance to stage 2. While this is happening, you will be in your own chamber Sasuke. Are there any questions? AI injected Sakura while Seiken helped Sasuke into the barrel after he took the pill. Once that was done, they sealed both in the barrel. Jirobo then grabbed the barrel and the four left the clearing. As they did, they didn't notice that Kazashi had managed to pull out a scroll with a seal on it. A quick info scroll used to send information that needed to be copied down quickly. Kazashi channeled the chakra into the seal, making the message he wanted appear. Once it did, the scroll rolled up. Sadly, Kazashi didn't have enough chakra to activate the signal seal. The pink-haired man died, with the scroll still in his hand. The couple's bodies wouldn't be found for 24 hours. By then, it would be too late to send a tracking party after the two. Thus Jiraiya had no choice but to label Sasuke as a C-rank missing nin. Two days later, Jiraiya was in the office with Tsunade, Danzo, Shikaku and Anbu, commander of Dragon. Jiraiya sighed as he leaned back. Three hours ago, two dead bodies were found in training ground 82. They have been identified as Haruno Mibuki and her husband Haruno Kizashi. Kizashi was holding a message scroll, but he died before he could activate the signal seal. The message revealed why his wife and him died. They were killed by their daughter Sakura when they tried to stop her and Sasuke from leaving with Shinobi from Itagakur. Danzo frowned upon hearing this. It's too late to send a retrieval team after them. We have no other choice but to declare Ichiha a missing nim, sadly Haruno is no longer a ninja, so we can't label her as well. But we should put a bounty on her head. Shikaku nodded. How long do you think it will take before Rachimaru steals Sasuke's body? Tsunade frowned as she said. I have a feeling he most likely changed bodies recently. I didn't heal the damage to his arms, so most likely he has changed bodies by now. A like that likely has a long cooldown before he could switch. He will also likely wait a few years before taking Sasuke's body, as he will want him to at least be older. Right now if he were to switch into his body, he would be stuck in the body in the beginning of puberty. As it will limit the amount of power he could use, even with enhancements. Anzo spoke up. My spy in Atagakur has told me that Arachimaru needs to wait three years, as he has recently changed his body. He can only use them every three years. Tsunade tapped her fingers on the armrest of her chair before she said. Three years, 17 would be the youngest age Sasuke could be at for Orochimaru to get his full strength out of the body. Your spy is probably right Danzo. Shikaku sighed as he leaned back. The question is, will Orochimaru keep the Sharingan after he moves on? Tsunade shook her head. I honestly don't know. Asno sighed as he said. My spy told me that Orochimaru keeps the bloodlines that were in the bodies he steals, even when he moves onto a new body. Ireya turned in his chair so he was looking out the windows. They had been darkened so that no one could see into the room, but the people inside could see outside. Before that happens, I think we should recall Itachi and reveal the truth behind the Ichiha massacre. Anzo looked at the back of the chair. Are you certain that is a good idea? He is currently our spy in the organization, if we recall him now they may move sooner rather than later. Gureya spoke slowly, as if he was tasting each word. No, I don't plan to recall him now. I plan to call him back two months before they are ready to move. Itachi will need treatment as he is currently extremely ill. It will also cause chaos in the Akatsuki's ranks and possibly delay their movement a month or two. He spun around and looked at Tsunade. We will need to bring those out as well. Tsunade stared right back. Are you certain? I'm absolutely certain, Itachi will need them more than anything. Gureya thought to himself. I need to step up Naruto's training. He's also gotten far enough with his elemental training that I can help him get a third element. I'm thinking Earth would be best for him. Shikaku spoke up. What's the next topic you need to talk about? Gureya leaned forward as he said. We need to discuss the escort arrangements for the next exams. They are in the allied village of Kumo. Two months later. Gureya sat at his desk, looking at the group in front of him. As you all know, the exams are in Kumo this time and will start in a week. Do we have any who want to sign their team up? Asuma took a puff of his cigarette. I nominate Team 10. I struck a nice guy pose. My team is ready for the exams, I nominate Team 9. Gurunai had been thinking when she spoke up. Jurei Asama, Kiba is currently in the hospital for the next two weeks because of an accident on the past mission. Would it be possible to have Naruto substituting for him? Gurei smiled. This actually works out pretty well. I was hoping a team would have a space open so Naruto could attend these exams. He had actually asked about it earlier this week. I'll talk to him later today. He looked at the rest of the any more nominated teams. 
After a couple minutes there were 5 more nominations, after that there were no more nominations. Ok then, now for the escort, of course the Jonin sensei would be going, but also we will be sending Kakashi, Gemma, and the Inoshika Cho team. Are there any questions? After a couple more minutes the group was dismissed. Jiraiya had a member go to collect Naruto, while he leaned back in the chair. Soon the blonde haired Jenin entered the room. Hey pervy sage, what did you need? Jiraiya twitched, but he didn't bother trying to correct Naruto. He knew the kid would just ignore him. He did call the previous gramps at times. Naruto, as you've probably heard, the exams are coming up. This time they will be held in Kumo. Naruto nodded. Yeah, what about Pervy Sage? Jiraiya tapped the desk as he said. There is an open spot on one of the teams that wants to join these exams. Their third member is in the hospital because of an accident on their last mission. They asked for a substitute, I was thinking of sending you. Naruto grinned, while well, he didn't participate in the last one because he wasn't sure if he was skilled enough, he was certain he was ready for this one. So which team am I being assigned to? Jiraiya looked at Naruto before speaking with a tone as if he was talking about the weather. Oh, just teammate. Naruto froze, before his grin grew and nearly split his face in two. As the grin grew, his eyes became narrow as he said. Oh really? Well that's awesome to hear, who am I going to be subbing in for? Jiraiya shivered. I feel bad for the other contestants in the exams. I know that expression too well. Last time I saw it, I ended up suffering quite a bit. Jiraiya managed to push down the bad feelings that were coming from the idea of sending Naruto to another village for the exams. He could just hear the complaints. You'll be replacing Kiba. You're to meet teammate at training ground 8 for tomorrow, you'll be leaving in two days. So you should get used to working with Shino and Hinata while you have the chance. Well I guess mostly Shino, since you and Hinata train together quite often. Naruto gives Jiraiya a thumbs up, looking scarily similar to Guy's youthful pose. That sounds like an awesome idea. Just you wait, by the end of these exams, I'll be a. I'll try it on my first try. Jiraiya grinned. If you do it, I'll treat you to all you can eat, Raymond. Naruto's grin changes from fox-like to positively evil. Prepare to go bankrupt then pervy sage. Now is there anything else you need? I have something I have to do. Jiraiya just waved. Go ahead and go, I need to get back to working on the paperwork, even with several shadow clones it still takes a while. See you later pervy sage. With those words Naruto exited the office. His next stop, the Higurashi Weapon Shop. Higurashi Weapon Shop. Naruto walked into the store to see Tenten behind the counter reading a book. She looked up ready to greet the customer when she saw Naruto. Oh Naruto, are you here to pick up your order? Yep, they are done right. Yeah just give me a few minutes to go get them. With those words Tenten went into the back, after a couple minutes she came back with a scroll and unrolled it before unsealing a few custom made throwing knives. Five dozen custom made throwing knives. Four dozen made of regular metal, and a dozen made of the chakra metal you provided. Just like you ordered Naruto. Two weeks ago, Naruto's clones had finally finished looking through the scrolls in the Yuzumaki clan storage rooms. Naruto had been shocked to learn that there had been a scroll full of chakra metal ingots. Naruto had later figured out that most likely the ingots were used for his father's signature kunai. It was then that Naruto had come up with an idea. Since he planned to eventually learn how to use the Horation, he would need markers. But he didn't want to use the same kunai as his father. Thus he had come up with his own design. The blades of the knives are black, with orange edges. The knives don't have a hilt, instead they have a flat part that is held between the user's fingers when tossed. In the very center of the blade was carved a small Yuzumaki spiral. Look up blue bomber throwing knives, just imagine them as orange instead of blue, and replace the biohazard mark with an Yuzumaki spiral. The Yuzumaki spiral is about the size of a dime. This had caused him to have a stroke of inspiration. What if he made throwing knives with special seals carved into them? These special sealing blades would be color-coded to help organize them. The throwing knives Tenten had unsealed were the result. The first four dozen weren't made of chakra metal, as they were meant to be disposable. They would be marked with destructive seals that would destroy the knives when activated. Their edges were white with a white Yuzumaki spiral. But Naruto planned to change the spiral color once he engraved the seals. The final dozen were made of chakra metal, Naruto had special plans for them, the edges of the blades were silver with a matching Yuzumaki spiral. Fenton leaned forward as she said. I'm really curious what these knives are for, mind telling me Naruto. Naruto grinned as he held up one of the white-edged knives. Now that would be telling, especially since these will have a use in the upcoming exams. Oh you'll be participating this time? Yep, sorry Tenten, but I have important things to do. He sealed up the knives and paid for them. With that he left, it was time to get to work on his surprise. Later, the Yuzumaki compound. Naruto entered the compound, hanging his hat on the hat rack near the door, while his coat went on the nearby coat rack before removing his shoes. 
he then headed towards a certain room of the compound. This room used to be his father's workroom, where he had studied seals and managed to figure out how to change the Horatian to the powerful it had become. In the corner was a workbench that Naruto would be working at. As he sat down at the workbench, he set down the scroll containing the throwing knives. Once he did he rearranged his scar so it would cover his mouth and nose to protect it in case he drew the seal wrong, then it could get a little explosive. He then grabbed a smaller scroll from a pouch on his utility belt and unsealed the contents. What appeared was a pair of green goggles, his old goggles he used to wear before he became a genin. They had been enhanced so they would help with his fuinjutsu work. They were very difficult to break and could act as a magnifying glass while he worked on a seal to help him notice minute problems. They would come in very handy with what he was about to do. The second item that was unsealed was a very small black metal box. He opened the box to reveal the item in it. It looked like a silver pen with multiple seals carved into it. But where the nib should be was instead a long needle. At the other end was a small seal shaped like an Uzumaki spiral. This was a special item, only able to be made by the Uzumaki clan, a seal carving needle. This needle had been his mother's and after she died it became ownerless. Now it was tied to Naruto via his blood. This item was needed to be able to do seal carving that the Uzumaki clan was known for. Kishina has brought this needle with her from Yuzushio, along with Shinjetsu. This needle would allow Naruto to carve seals into metal. But because of the type of carving needle it was, the seals would be keyed to him directly. That's why Minato never had Kashina carve the seals of the Horatian for him and instead use chakra paper wrapped around the kunai handle. Naruto placed his thumb on the seal and twitched slightly when he felt a needle jab into his thumb before blood was drawn and stored in the silver part of the carving needle. Once enough blood was taken, the seals on the silver body glowed before the needle was pulled out of his thumb. The blood that was taken would be used in the sealing process, infusing the seals with blood to not only key them to his chakra signature, but to make certain the seal would work as required. Naruto took a couple minutes to let the wound on his thumb heal before he unsealed a wide-edged disposable throwing knife. He put the tip of his needle against the white part of the flat of the blade, it was time to begin carving, this knife would be an explosive knife. Two days later. Naruto stood with teammate at the gates to the village. Most of the other groups that were going to Kumo were waiting as well. What were they waiting for you might ask. They were currently waiting for Kakashi to arrive, he was an hour late, although that shouldn't be surprising. But they were also missing Sanadi, who was coming along as the medic for the group. Naruto suddenly felt as if he should move. Doing as his instinct told him to, Naruto stepped to the left a few steps, much to the confusion of Hinata who he had been talking to. It was at this moment that there was a feminine shout of rage, and a silver and green blur shot past where he had been and impacted the ground in front of the gate. In the crater that had formed was Kakashi, who had his head buried in the dirt. Coming up behind the group was Tsunade, who had launched said. Naruto turned to Tsunade as he said. Hey granny, you nearly hit me with the flying pervert. Tsunade twitched as she said. Well then you shouldn't stand in front of the gold brat. As they were talking, Kakashi had managed to dig himself out of the crater. He stood up and pulled out his book as he said. Yo, sorry I got lost on the route of life, Tsunade was kind enough to guide me. Everyone sweat dropped at that excuse. It was at this moment Jureya who was here to see them off, cleared his throat. Well now that the last two members of the escort have arrived, I want to say a few things. Once they were all looking at him he began to speak. Now as I'm sure you all know, the exams you will be attending are in Kumo. I expect you to all be on your best behavior. Also, do not give the Reikage a reason to toss you out of Kumo, I'm looking at you Naruto. If when I arrive there for the finals and find out you have pranked the entire village, I will have you on tour at duty for the next six months. Naruto stiffened, he decided right then and there that the prank he had planned wouldn't go off until after they left. He would just need to leave a shadow clone to watch it. Jiraiya grinned as he said. Now go and make the village proud. With those words Jiraiya stepped back. As he stepped back, Asuma stepped forward, as he blew out a smoke ring he said. Okay, for all you who are wondering. It will take us four days to arrive, this will give us a day to get settled in. You have all been given scrolls containing your location in the formation. Are there any questions? After a few minutes, no one had spoken up. Okay then, let's move out. But that the group left through the gate and jumped into the trees. Four days later. The Kanoha representatives arrived at the gates to Kumo. Once they signed in, they were requested to stay there for a bit while their guide was called. It was a few minutes later that a blonde woman in her mid-twenties arrived. As she walked up to the group her dark eyes wandered over them before she smiled at them. Welcome to Kumagakur, my name is Yujito Nai. If you will please follow me, I lead you to the inn that is reserved for you all. As she led them towards the inn, a playful female voice spoke up in her mind. Kitten, I can sense him. My eldest brother is in this group. His Jinchuruki is in this group. Which one is he, Matatabi? 
the one with spiky blonde hair and the whisker marks on his cheeks. The seal is pretty strong, so it's tough to sense, but I'm almost certain. Wasn't Shukaku's Jinchuruki in the last group I escorted. So currently there are four Jinchuruki in Kumo. Um kitten, we have a problem. What's wrong with Matatabi? Filler B is heading this way. Wait are you serious fucking hell. Suddenly they all heard a crash and a voice yelling at someone named Killer B coming from the next street over. It seems like we have dodged a bullet. Bujito soon arrived at the hotel that was housing the Kanoha representatives, the Heavenly Tower. Little did the group know, Aya Jenin had seen Naruto. Said Iwa Jenin headed back to his group to tell them how he saw a Jenin from Kanoha that looked like a young Minato. A day later. The temporary teammates stood outside the venue for the first exam. It was a two-story building that was extremely wide. They needed to report to room 213. As they reached the second floor, they all noticed a very subtle thought appear in their minds that they should go back down the stairs. They pushed past it and soon arrived at the room. As they entered the room, Shino and Hinata were treated to something they remembered from Kanoha. The killing intent of the other village genin. Naruto just brushed it off, his visits with Kurama had helped him get used to it. The ancient fox had helped him train his resistance against it and even taught him how to project it. So Naruto decided to counter. He looked at the genin as he released his killing intent. Every single genin releasing killing intent was treated to the image of a massive figure wearing a black robe and a fox mask, with nine bladed bone tails waving behind it hovering over them. As it opened the mouth of its mask it released an eerie howl and drew a scythe from its back. It was at this moment that about ten teams, mostly from minor villages, screamed in fear before they passed out and the image disappeared. The rest of the genin were left trembling from the killing intent. Those who are wondering, this is my version of the demon image that Yuza made during his final fight. Honestly I always saw that image working similar to the gourmet cell demons from Toriko. Thus we got Naruto's killing intent image. It will appear again, trust me on that. Shortly after, the room was full of genin waiting for the proctor to arrive. Suddenly, the lights went out as a faint beat was heard somewhere in the room. From a balcony in the back of the room they were in, a single light shone down upon a certain blonde-haired Kumo Shinobi with seven swords sheathed on his back. He was bouncing to the beat that could be heard throughout the hall. The Kumo genin that were there all sweat dropped when they saw who it was. It was at this moment that the shinobi began to rap to the beat. Know my name, know my fame, don't be lame. Eight tails, that's me, Da Killer B. Battle after battle is what you'll face if you don't want to end a big disgrace. So hold on to your tails or else you'll fail. Lariat. A dark-skinned man with no shirt and a long white coat appeared behind the rapping shinobi and hit him with an outstretched crooked arm, smashing him into the ground. God damn it B, I told you to stay away from the exams. The man who was ranting bent down and grabbed the man named B and started to squeeze his face. Derry, get the exams started while I punish my brother. With those words the man who could only be the rakage dragged Killer B away by his face. All the while Killer B was screaming and begging for mercy. The voice sounded from near the door to the room. Man this is so dull. I'm Derry, the proctor for the exam. The genin turned to see a dark-skinned man with shaggy white hair. He walked forward slowly until he was in the center of the room. You're all here to try and become. One of the most important things for it to know is the ability to gather accurate information. One such way to get said information is from a captured enemy. For this exam, you will be interrogating a prisoner. The prisoner knows the location that you are to report to if you hope to move on to the second exam. You are allowed to use whatever means necessary to obtain this information so long as you don't kill or maim them. If you do kill or maim them, you will be disqualified. Now, once you leave this room you will meet up with the person who is holding the sign with your sensei's name. They will show you to your interrogation room. The mate waited five minutes for everyone to leave the room before following. When they left, they found that most of the genin had left with them, while a few straggling teams were leaving at the moment. The only one still standing in place was the one holding the sign that said Kurana Yul. Naruto led the three as they walked up to the. The young man was light-skinned with blonde hair. So you're the team I need to escort huh, my name is V. Follow me to the interrogation room. The three of them followed behind the blonde haired as he led them down into the basement of the building. They were led to a door, beside the door was a clear window made of what Naruto assumed was one-way glass. V turned to the three of them as he said. Inside here is your convict. He has the location of the second exams. You have three hours to get the information from him. The group entered the room and looked at the convict in front of them. He was fair-skinned with greasy black hair and a hook nose. His eyes had a slightly crazed gleam in them. Oh my, so you're the ones who have been sent to interrogate me. Well please, don't expect it to be easy. On a table near where he was handcuffed there sat a scroll. Shino grabbed it and opened it. Prisoner 6978, T. Prisoner's crimes are three counts rape and murder. Victims were found torn to pieces. 
prisoner is scheduled to be executed in two weeks. He ignored them and was instead leering at Hinata. Naruto noticed that he stepped in front of her, blocking his view of her as he reached into a pouch. Derry said we can't maim him right. That means I can cause a bit of damage, correct? As he asks this he slowly withdraws a throwing knife with a cobalt blue edge and a white Uzumaki spiral. Shino nodded. Yes, as long as we don't cause permanent damage to his body, then we will not be disqualified. Naruto grinned as he spun his knife. Then this is perfect. With those words he stabbed the knife into T's leg. Before stepping back. T flinched as the knife entered his leg. But he chuckled as he was about to speak. But it was at that moment that the area around him began to blur and change. The three genin disappeared and he found himself in a black void. As he entered the void, the knife in his leg disappeared and the pain died. It was at that moment that he heard a deep chuckle and found his chair spun around. When it did he found himself face to face with a demonic face. The face was framed by a mane of shaggy white hair, from under the white hair protruded two red horns. The figure attached to the face was gaunt and wore a white kimono with a set of prayer beads around its neck. Its mouth was stretched in a horrible parody of a smile, between its teeth was a sheathed tanto that made the grin even worse. From its body radiates an aura that screams of death and suffering. Honestly, I feel like the Uzumaki clan most likely knew what the Shinigami looked like. I mean they developed a reaper death seal and even had a mask to allow them to free those trapped by said seal. They know what the god of death looks like. The demon removed the tanto as its grin stretched wider, splitting its face nearly in two. So you've finally arrived, I've been waiting for you T. T felt as if his very being was in danger. Who are you? The being chuckled before it said. Oh I am so glad you asked, I am the judge. It drew the tanto out. I am the jury. It finished drawing out the tanto as it leaned forward, so its face was right in front of his as it said. And I'm your executioner. The being pointed his tanto at him as he said. For scum like you, I have a very special punishment. You will experience everything your victims went through for all eternity. Meanwhile in the interrogation room they all watched as the prisoner thrashed and screamed. Shino looked at Naruto, who was kneeling on the ground, his hands in a ram seal as he focused on the chakra. What was that knife you stabbed him with? Naruto's voice was strained as he spoke. Both Shino and Hinata already knew about his heritage, Naruto had told Shino on the trip to the exams. He rather liked talking to Shino. Special Uzumaki clan seal, the Uzumaki clan made seals to make up for their weaknesses. Jinjutsu and medical ninjutsu. He's suffering from an extremely powerful tie to the seal and the knife. Ninjutsu seals are different from normal seals in that if they aren't perfect, it takes 10 times more chakra and has to keep channeling, but will still work. Because the seal isn't perfect, I need to keep channeling chakra to it. Seal was used as punishment for criminals who were sentenced to life sentences or execution. It forces them to experience their crimes from the victim's viewpoint. What was the seal you painted on his hand? It's a lie detecting seal, pretty easy to make. It will flash if he lies. After a few more minutes Naruto spoke up once again. Shino, remove the knife please. Shino walked forward and pulled the knife out of the convict's leg. Naruto took the knife back as T came out of the illusion and began to scream. Please, don't make me go through it again. I'll do anything at all. Naruto spoke up slowly. Then tell us the location of the second exam. It's at the Thunder Peak, where the heavens meet the earth. Naruto nodded as he cleaned the knife. Thank you for the information. He didn't need to confirm it, as the seal didn't flash, proving he was telling the truth. The team left the room and Shino stepped forward and said. Thunder Peaks, where the heavens meet the earth. He smiled as he pulled out a scroll. This has directions to Thunder Peak, you are to report there at 8am tomorrow. Keep the scroll, you will need it. Naruto took the scroll and stored it in a pouch on his belt before teammate left. As they walked away, V looked into the room and shook his head. Whatever they fucking did to him, I hope I never have to experience it. That's what guys, you get to this chapter. Amic, the inauguration day incident. Gareya was sitting in the office, a smile on his face as he relaxed. The inauguration had gone perfectly. He was now the fifth. He flinched when the memories from his shadow clones dispelled. Seriously, why would they aim there of all places? A couple minutes later was when the girlish screams began. Gareya looked out the window to see Kakashi and Abisu being chased by a mob of women in only towels. Somehow said women had various weapons and were screaming for their deaths. They finally caught the two right at the base of the tower and began to viciously beat them. Jiraiya couldn't help but see the irony in this. His shadow clones had been under the improved henge and made themselves look like Kakashi and Abisu because those two were the closest to openly peeking on women. But, for them to be caught right outside the tower, was Kami trying to tell him something. It was at that exact moment that he realized what it meant. There were no shortcuts in the way of the super pervert. He didn't need to use clones, there was a peeping tool in the office. 
Sadly Jiraiya had said these things out loud, just as Tsunade had walked through the door. His girlish shrieks of pain echoed throughout the village that day. Amic, how Team 9 got the information. Team 9 had been at it for 30 minutes, trying to convince their prisoner to talk, but they were failing horribly. Suddenly Tenten spoke up. I have an idea, give me a minute. With those words she left the room. A couple minutes later she came back, dragging Naruto by his coat. Um Tenten, why are you dragging me? Tenten pulled him to his feet. No time, Lee, you and Naruto should hug right now. As she said this she tossed a pair of earplugs over to Niji who caught them and quickly put them in his ears. Lee jumped up as he shouted. Naruto and I are finally allowed to celebrate our youth together. Lee. Naruto. Lee. Naruto. They hugged, and that's when everything changed. This time it was different from before. Instead of a ship, they found themselves in what appeared to be an office. Tenten and Niji both closed their eyes in preparation for what was about to happen. Sadly the criminal Azakaru didn't know what was going on, but for some reason he was now free. It was at this moment that a voice shouted out. Such a manly display. Azakaru turned and was terrified to see a massive man in a military uniform. The man was bald, with just a single blonde cowlick. He also had a blonde mustache, but the most terrifying thing was how huge he was. He made the rakage look small. Suddenly the man's jacket and shirt dissolved as he struck a pose, complete with sparkles. Allow me to show you the art of manly embrace that has been passed down in the Armstrong family for generations. The man, who Azakaru assumed was named Armstrong, sprinted at him and grabbed him, pulling into a hug. Azakaru did what any sane man and many insane men would do in this situation. He screamed and began to beg for mercy. Five minutes later, Tenten and Niji walked out of the room dragging a comatose Naruto and Rock Lee. The two hadn't wanted to stop hugging, so they had been forced to knock them out. Tenten had a suspicion that Naruto did it because he enjoyed torturing those watching. While Team 9 had completed their first exams, they had points docked off for causing their proctor mental damage. Chapter 7, The Kumo Thunder Peaks. It was the morning of the second exam, and currently Team 8 was standing in a crowd that was in front of two small stands. Behind the two strands was a massive mountain. Around the mountain was a fence, similar to the fence around the Forest of Death in Kanoha. In front of the crowd was Yujito who stood with a smile on her face. Yujito pulled out a pocket watch and checked it before she clapped. Okay, everyone is here. She pointed at the gate that was visible as she said. So welcome to the Thunder Peel, where the heavens meet the earth. At the top of this is a large shrine, it's where Killer B, the weirdo who interrupted the first exam lives. Don't worry, the rakage is keeping him away from it. Now this second exam is pretty simple to understand. There are 35 teams. You all will be released into Thunder Peak. Each of you will present the direction scroll you were given by your previous proctor, and you have to sign some papers, basically saying Kumo isn't responsible for your death or maiming. After you've signed those papers, you will be given one of three tokens, either the sun, the star, or the moon token. As she said this she held up the three tokens. Each of them was about the size of the ring on a kunai. The moon token was silver with a crescent moon on it. The sun was golden with a sun symbol on it. While the star token is bronze and has a star on it. You have a week to collect all three tokens and climb to the top of the mountain. You must also have your whole team alive to qualify. Are there any questions? After a couple minutes of no questions she nodded and spoke again. Now a couple things I'm legally obligated to tell you. First as I'm sure you can see, about halfway up, the forest stops growing. Keep in mind that is the most dangerous part. Second, I highly doubt that more than five teams will pass. With your scroll, you will be given a signal seal tied to your team number. If you get into trouble with some of the creatures in there and you absolutely can't get out of it, trigger the seal. Trust me, it can mean the difference between life and death. What she didn't mention was the fact that the seal released a bit of Killer Bee's chakra upon activation, thus not only allowing the user to be saved from the beasts of the mountain. They all obeyed Killer Bee as the top dog, but it would also allow the sentry to retrieve them to find them. Now, form an orderly line and head into one of the stands and get your token. Once you do, they will escort you to your gate. Team 8 lined up in the right-hand group. Little did they realize, the Iwa Genin teams, all seven teams, were planning to target them. Iwa's hatred for the fourth made them decide to target Naruto because of his appearance. But Team 8 didn't realize this yet. 30 minutes later. Team 8 had gotten their token, which was a moon token. Said token was currently resting in one of the pouches on Naruto's utility belt. They now stood outside gate 34, waiting to be led into Thunder Peak. It was at this moment that a voice sounded from the speaker nearby. The exam will be starting in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, go, go, go. But those words the gate opened and Team 8 ran into the training ground, the gate closing behind them. The three took to the trees and began to hop deeper into the forest. As they did they began to discuss their plans. 
Shino, who was in the back, said. I believe we should get deeper into the forest first and then set up a base camp. Why? Because it will allow us to have a staging point to gather the two other tokens. Naruto nodded as he said. Yeah, if we set up a base camp, I can put in defenses to protect us. Hinata-chan, keep an eye for any other genin. If you see any with the sun or star token then tell. Hinata nodded and every few minutes she would turn on her Byakugan to check the area around them. Each Byakugan had a different range depending on the wielder. Hinata's Byakugan had the largest range for her age group. Her Byakugan could currently see in all directions for a distance of around 2 kilometers. It was sure to grow even larger by the time she was an adult. Thanks to this range and the speed she had become used to shifting through the information provided by her long-distance sight, she was able to see any threats and steer the team away from them. This went on for around five hours. As they moved they would make small talk to keep themselves entertained. Suddenly Hinata spoke up. Naruto-kun, Shino, I found a team with a star token. From the hit I ate it seems they are from Kurigakur. The two stopped and both turned to Hinata. Naruto was the one who spoke up. Where is Hinata-chan? She pointed slightly left of the direction they were heading. They are northeast of our position by about one and a half kilometers. They seem to be setting up camp at the moment. Naruto grinned as he said. Perfect, let's go. The three began to head towards the other group. Within a matter of minutes they had reached a tree that was far enough for them to hide in easily. But still gave a decent view of the camp that was being set up. The Jen and team had two boys and one female. They seemed to be about Naruto's age. One boy had fair skin and dark hair that reached his shoulders. Strapped to his back was a large Zambato. The other boy had pale bluish skin and sharpened teeth, his hair was bone wide and cut extremely short, and at his waist was a pair of Kodachi. The girl had fair skin and blue hair that was done up in a ponytail. She was the only one without a weapon. At least the only one without a visible weapon. Naruto finished studying the ground before he turned to Shino and Hinata. Okay. Hinata-chan, where exactly is the token? Hinata reactivated her by Akigen, after a few moments she said. It's in the girl's kunai pouch. Naruto nodded as he said. Okay I got a plan. Trust me on this and stay here. With those words he created a shadow clone, and both of them began to move out. As they got closer to the campground, the shadow clone used the hinge to change into a star token. Naruto grabbed the token as it fell and moved closer. He hid behind a tree just outside of the clearing and held up the token. With a puff of smoke, his hinged shadow clone used the substitution to switch with the real star token. Naruto grinned as he could sense this wasn't his clone anymore. But that done he snuck away. Ten minutes later he was back with the team and held up the token. I'll explain what I did after we got away. The two nodded and the group of them quickly left, hopping through the trees quickly to get away from the camp. After around 15 minutes they stopped and Naruto laughed as he said. That was pretty easy. Shino looked at Naruto as he said. What did you do Naruto-san? Naruto flipped the token once before slipping it into his pouch with the moon token. My hinge is different from yours Shino. Because of all the chakra I have and the horrible chakra control I had during the academy years. I would overcharge the hinge to the point it became a solid disguise instead of an illusion. So I made a shadow clone and had it hinge into the star token, then substitute itself with a real token. Shino frowned. That's interesting to know. It was also a very clever plan. We should probably do that with the third token. If we can avoid fighting then that's for the best. We do not know exactly what is on this mountain. Not to mention the proctor said it gets more dangerous the closer to the top we get. Naruto looked up at the sky that was visible through the canopy of the trees. Well we will keep our eyes peeled. Let's go guys. The team began heading north once again, towards the exit to the forest and beginning of the mountain. Little did teammate know, they wouldn't be getting another token peacefully. Before the end of this mission, all three of them will have been forced to kill, for the first time. Two and a half days later, halfway up Thunder Peaks. The sun was beginning to set, currently teammate was setting up camp in a location surrounded by boulders. As Hinata and Shino set up the sleeping bags, fire pit and wood supply and other things needed for the camp. Naruto was setting up defenses. He had set up multiple trap seals outside the circle of boulders to protect it. Currently he was setting up few injutsu defenses in the actual circle itself. He had his sealing brush out and was painting multiple different interconnecting seals on the boulders and ground around said boulders. He had been at it for an hour, but he was finally done painting the seals. He cleaned his brush off with some water before drying it and sealing it away. Now comes the final part. He placed his hand on a strange hand-shaped seal and began to channel his chakra into the seal. As his chakra spread the seals began to glow blue, soon the entire ray was glowing a bright blue. After a few seconds the seals vanished into the stone and Naruto sat down, letting out a breath of relief. There we go, finally finished. 
As he sat there resting, he could help but chuckle when he remembered Jiraiya's reaction to how quickly he learned Fuenjutsu. Especially when he learned that he had reached the point of being able to do carved seals. It was actually funny hearing him rant about how unfair it was that a clan of hyperactive redheads were so talented in the hardest to learn shinobi art. A shinobi art that required them to sit still no less. Hinata walked over to the resting blonde as she asked. Are you okay Naruto-kun? Naruto grinned as he said. Yeah, just tired. Drawing complicated seals like those are tiring. To think that when I reach seal master level, I'll be able to draw seals that make these look like a kid's painting. Well then, how about you come over to the campfire? We can make some dinner and discuss the watch schedule. Naruto nodded as he stood back up and followed her, but as he did he twitched and stopped. Hinata turned to see Naruto looking around, confused. What's wrong with Naruto-kun? I could have sworn I heard someone say something. But I couldn't hear it clearly. He shook his head as he said. Did I just imagine it? Naruto did not imagine it. What he was experiencing was the beginning stage of the ability that came from training in the black leg style. The power of willpower, hockey. Usually someone who trains in the black leg style would need several years of training to even think of unlocking it. But Naruto, who has not only abused the shadow clones to the point of it being ridiculous as well training with a man who does not know the concept of rest might guy. This has pushed his awakening forward exponentially. But his hockey needed one more thing to awaken fully. Something that would come soon. Three kilometers to the west. In the location three kilometers away were all seven of the Iowa teams. Twenty-one genin ready to get what they considered justice. Near a genin with white hair, the ground shook slightly before a mole popped out. It was the young man's personal summon. The mole spoke up in a deep scruffy voice. Tenji, I found the team you wanted me to find. They are three kilometers east here in a circle formed by boulders. It's been heavily fortified with Fuenjutsu, so I can't get too close. The one with white hair, who was apparently named Tenji nodded. Were you at least able to tell what kind of Fuenjutsu might have been used? The mole tapped the ground with one claw. I couldn't tell you the exact types, but I can tell you that there definitely are lots of traps. The blonde used a lot of shadow clones to make them, so I can't tell you where they all are. Also the area around the campsite is reinforced from the amount of chakra I sensed. You will not be able to manipulate the earth in that circle. I honestly would recommend not attacking them in the circle because of those seals. The mole shivered before he said. Do you have to attack that group? The blonde gave me a really bad feeling. He wasn't even looking at me. But still it felt like a massive predator was looking at me like I was lunch. I'll keep that in mind in Hakori. Now why don't you go back home? The mole named Hakori sighed before he said. Just please be careful Tenji. With those words Hakori disappeared in a plume of smoke. Tenji turned to the rest as he said. You all heard what Hakori said, correct? The group nodded and acknowledged the information. Then we need to come up with a plan of attack. One of them, a male genin with a broken nose, scoffed as he said. We outnumber them seven to one. What do we need to plan, we just smoke them out of the cave, then overwhelm them with numbers. The other genin quickly agreed. Warning, infidim. It wasn't odd that the group were thinking this way. Each shinobi village had its own unique way of fighting that they trained in. The Wagaker was known for the fact it had the largest amount of shinobi out of the five great ninja villages. Their tactics mostly relied on overwhelming the enemy army with many troops and slowly taking ground. Any ground the Iwa shinobi took became reinforced by earth ninjutsu. This made it difficult for other villages to reclaim land that was taken by Wagaker. Garigakur was the village best known for their stealth tactics. This village was known for the fact it had the best assassins. The seven swordsmen of the mist are feared for their stealth skills. Before the bloodline purge, it had also been the village with the most keke Genkai. Humagakur was the only village that produced a better swordsman than Kurigakur. It was also the village with the highest number of shinobi swordsmen. They are also known for the fact that each shinobi trains and fights with another. This is known as the combo partner. This tradition began to appear in Kanoha as well after the alliance was formed. While Sunagakur might have the least shinobi it makes up for it by being the village best known for its poisons. Not only does the village puppet core use these poisons, but quite a few of the other shinobi do as well. Wind specialists use their wind to spread airborne poison. Even some from the clan known for its magnetic release Keke Jinkai occasionally soak their weapons in poisons. The thing Kanahagakur is most well known for is its teamwork. It is also known for the fact it produces many powerful shinobi. Currently including the missing nin from Kanoha, it has the most S-class nin currently alive. Infidump over, thank you for putting up with it. Enji sighed as he said. Then how exactly do we smoke them out? Genin with a broken nose grinned as he said. Really simple, we use explosive tags. Toss a few in there and see how long they stay in there with explosives being chucked in there. Tenji nodded. That could work, let's go with that. 
okay everyone, we attack at dawn. We will soon have our revenge on that bastard Namikaze. Dawn, at the cave where teammate are staying. Naruto was sitting against one of the boulders. His scarf was pulled up to cover the lower part of his face, and his hat brim pulled down to shadow his eyes. His eyes which were hidden by the brim's shadow were watching the area around him. Nearby were Hinata and Shino who were sleeping. Naruto was on the last hour of his watch. Once the sun finished rising he would wake the others, and then after breakfast they would move out. He twitched when he heard the sound that he had been hearing all night. Like that of a voice whispering in his mind. He knew for a fact it wasn't Kurama. He had actually visited Kurama during the middle of his watch to ask him about it. The ancient fox didn't know what it was either. It was at that moment that Naruto's head shot up and he frowned. His sensor seals had been tripped. He stood up and gripped Shinjutsu, making the sheathed blade appear at his side. He then went and woke up Hinata and Shino. As Shino stood up the explosions began. The two turned to look at Naruto who just chuckled sheepishly. He had set up a lot of traps. Not all of them were explosive tags. He just hoped no one triggered those two special traps. He twitched when he felt a special seal go off. Never mind, they're screwed. Seconds later the second seal was tripped and Naruto fascipumed. He felt so bad for using those seals now. But he couldn't resist, his mom's note said that they were great for pranks for those you despised. Soon the explosions were done going off. Naruto turned to the other two, and they all nodded and moved closer to the boulders and looked out. They saw a lot of explosion marks and scattered body parts. Hinata and Shino both ended up throwing up from the sight. Naruto barely managed to keep it down. It was at that moment that a large rock came flying towards Naruto. Naruto managed to duck under the strike, and that was when they realized there were still enemies attacking. Seven in all, coming from three different directions. Teammate looked at each other and nodded just as the seven entered the circle. As the Iwa Genin entered the circle, the seals began to glow again, and the ground glowed again, sealing it away from being used as a weapon, thus sealing away the Iwa Genin's strongest weapon. The three Genin charged at the enemy. Shino and Hinata each took on two, while Naruto attacked the last three. Shino's battle. Shino stood before the two Genin he would be facing. Two young men. Both with black hair and identical faces, most likely twins. The twins scoffed upon seeing Shino, one of them spoke up as he said. What's with a big coat and glasses freak, afraid someone will see how ugly you are. Shino ignored what they said and slowly raised his arms. As he did, a swarm of insects flew from his large sleeves. Shall we begin? The other twin frowned as he said. So you're from the Aburum clan huh? Let's see how you like getting squashed bug boy. The twins ran through hand seals in turn before slamming their hands on the ground. Earth style. Earthquake slam. Sadly the twins weren't the sharpest knives in the drawer. In fact they were not knives, instead they were spoons. They didn't pay attention when Hikori said that manipulating the earth wouldn't work in the circle. So imagine their surprise when the technique didn't work. Shino, realizing this, rushed forward and released a wave of insects at one of them. Secret technique. Insect sphere. One of the twins managed to just get away. But the other wasn't quite as quick and was engulfed in a sphere of insects that began to feed on his chakra. The twin that got away, whose name was Woe turned to his brother shouted out. Bo, damn it, how dare you do that to my brother. The twin who wasn't being mauled by insects, raised his arm as his skin began to glow brown. With that he charged at Shino and swung at him. Shino ducked and swung his leg, sweeping the young man's legs from under him. As the twin fell Shino punched him lightly, getting a female beetle on him. Before engulfing the second twin in a swarm as well. He moved back and looked at the two thrashing twins and frowned behind his collar. Did I get the easy enemies? It was at that moment that Naruto screamed Hinata's name, and a burst of bloodlust with a shockwave erupted from behind the Aburum. He turned and was shocked at what he saw. Shino vs Twins, Bo and Wo, winner is Shino. Battle, Hinata vs Two Genin. Hinata had Hinode drawn and was in her starting stance, one hand holding Hinode around the middle, as she held it slightly behind her. Her other hand was held out, her palm ready to strike. She frowned as the two male Genin leered at her. She tried to fight off the shivers coming from how they were looking at her, but it was difficult. I am really starting to regret not wearing the coat anymore. Hinata knew she was more developed than most 14 years old. I might just have to castrate them for leering at me like that. Hinata froze for a moment. I have spent way too much time with Anko-sensei. The two young men were as different as night and day. One was short and fat with brown hair. The other was tall and extremely thin with gray hair. The short one said with a deep voice. Jin, you don't mind if we take her alive do you? The grey-haired young man grinned as he said. I think you and I are thinking the same thing, Tendo. Hinata spun Hinode as she looked at the two with unease. Not because she doubted that she could win. More because of the fact they were just looking at her like she was some kind of sex toy. This was actually the reason she wore the large coat for so long. 
She developed younger than all the other girls in her class, so she wore the coat to hide it. She was worried that if boys started to ask her out, Naruto wouldn't be interested in her, thinking that she was that kind of girl. As the two young men leered at her, she became tired of it and rushed forward spinning Hinode as she did. She spun around and struck the one named Jin in the arm. The surprised Jenin barely managed to dodge backwards. Tendo, who seemed to have been ready unlike his tall counterpart, lunged at her with a kunai. Inada ducked under the strike and thrust her free hand up, hitting a chakra point in his wrist, as well as knocking the kunai out of his hand in the process. Tendo jumped back hissing as he held his right wrist at his waist. His hand was numb to the point of being unusable. Luckily for him, Hinata didn't get the chance to push her advantage, as Jin had managed to get over his shock and ran through a series of hand signs. Earth style. Stone pistol jutsu he began to spit several pebbles at high speed. As they got close to Hinata they turned into boulders the size of her torso. She was forced to jump out of the way. As she landed, a kunai came flying at her back. She spun quickly, knocking the kunai out of the air with Hinode. When she did she raced forward and swung her staff that was held in a two-handed grip at the head of Tendo who was forced to duck, only for Hinata to release her right hand from the staff and strike the dodging Tendo in the chest with her palm, sending fire nature chakra. Rushing into his chakra network. She dodged to the side to avoid another barrage of boulders from Jin. As she did, she noticed that Tendo was holding his chest and coughing up blood. She rushed at Jin. She was glad to know that the fire nature chakra was working. Jin was forced to backpedal to dodge the barrage of staff strikes and palm thrusts that came at him. But even though he managed to 9 dodge most, two Juho strikes managed to slip through. Using a technique she developed through the use of the first step of the Rasengan training, she managed to curve the chakra from those two strikes to knock out three chakra points each. His right arm was now completely useless and it was infected with burning fire chakra that was burning his chakra network. She spun him out and struck at his head. Jin, who was distracted by the pain, was slow to react and took a hard hit to the head. He was unconscious before he hit the ground. Anada spun and ducked under a kunai launched by Tendo, before rushing forward to strike him in the stomach with Hinode. The air left the short boy before Hinata sent a Juho strike at his back, looking to knock out his main chakra point with a curving strike. Sadly Tendo managed to recover quicker, and Hinata hit the top of his head instead. Upon impact she reflexively released chakra into him, destroying his brain. It was only as the short boy fell did she register what she just did. She froze, unable to understand what she had done. It was at this moment that one of the genin facing Naruto had dashed away from him. He charged at Hinata from behind, his tanto drawn. She was too slow to react and turned just to get slashed diagonally across her torso. She lost her balance and fell back, hitting her head on the ground, blacking out. As darkness consumed her vision she heard Naruto scream her name, then a shockwave, a wordless roar of rage, and the strongest bloodlust she had ever felt was released. Naruto vs. Three Genin. Naruto stood ready to fight, facing the three Genin. They had been in this position for a couple minutes. He had expected them to attack him by now. There was a white-haired young man, Tenji, a young woman with long black hair. There was also a young man with short black hair, holding a tanto. He was the only one with a visible weapon. The black-haired man grinned as he said. Finally, we can get our revenge on the Namika's bastard. He might be dead, but we can take out his brat. Are you too ready Tenji, Aika? The girl grinned as she said. You're correct, Ryuga. Now let's kill this blonde brat. Naruto looked at them with a deadpan expression on his face, with his hat pushed back a little as he said. You all seriously attack me because you suspect I might be the fourth Hokage's son. Are you people mentally ill? He didn't bother denying the fact he was the fourth son. There was no point, it was obvious that they were certain not to mention it was the truth. The boy named Ryuga scoffed as he said. Yeah right, I don't know how you tree huggers manage to hide you brat. But it's obvious you're that bastard's child. But don't worry, you won't be going to the afterlife alone. Before Naruto could react, Ryuga raced towards Hinata. Naruto tried to chase after him, but he was forced to jump back to dodge attacks from Tenji and Aika. Naruto was forced to watch as Hinata was slow to reach and suffered a slash across her torso. As she fell he felt his head begin to throb and he heard a distorted and dark voice say. They dare to hurt Hinata. We must make them pay. The last thing he clearly felt was all-encompassing anger and then everything became coated in red. At that point it was difficult for him to think straight. The only thought going through his head was. Kill those who hurt Hinata. Make them suffer for their crime. Denji backed off, his face filled with fear at what had just happened. The bloodlust that filled the air was so powerful that he had trouble breathing. He silently cursed Ryuga for what he had done. Ryuga had attacked the Hyuga girl while she was frozen from killing Tendo. Now they were facing a monster. Naruto had become covered in a red film of bubbling chakra. 
As the chakra finished coating him it took the shape of a fox, and a single tail of chakra appeared behind him. The genin knew what that chakra's was, it was the chakra of A. They had just angered Jinchuruki. But not just any Jinchuruki, the Jinchuruki of the Kaiubi no Yoko. Sadly for the Iwa genin, it just got worse for them. As this anger triggered two things to awaken. The first was his hockey, allowing Nero to sense the world around him and the intent of others. Not to mention the ability to increase the strength of his attacks. But Naruto's hockey awakening wasn't the worst part. Neither was the red bubbling chakra. No, the worst part was what appeared above Naruto. It was the figure that appeared in the first exam. But somehow it had become more detailed. The figure was wearing a black robe that seemed to absorb the light and hid most of its figure. It wore a wide and red extremely detailed kitsune mask that stretched out in the front like a snout and had a mouth that opened slowly, releasing a stream of black-colored smoke. Behind it waved nine bladed bone tails. As they waved they cut through the air. Unlike before when it held a scythe, it now held in its right hand a blood-red katana with a white handle. The kitsune mask opened and began to laugh insanely. Its laughter was distorted, as if two people were laughing at once. Think Hollow's and Jetsu's laughter in his fight against Baikuya. Naruto began to sway slightly from side to side. As he did his arms moved slightly, but the movement was weird. As if he was a puppet being guided by strings. The young blonde's head had been down ever since the shockwave had burst out. It was at this point that his head slowly rose. Soon, they could see his eyes under the brim of his hat, the right one was blood red with a slit pupil. But the left eye was a shade of purple that matched an amethyst, but the purple was odd. It was a vertical emerald green bar that bled into the purple iris. It was at that moment that a voice broke the silence. It was Shinjetsu who spoke. Naruto, are you still there? Naruto didn't answer, instead a wide demented grin split the teenager's face. His hand flexed slightly, and Shinjetsu fell to the ground before Naruto vanished in a blur of motion. When he reappeared, his arm was through the girl like his chest. With an insane laugh he pulled his arm back, holding the young woman's still beating heart, and crushed it in his hand. Aika fell to the ground like a puppet with its strings cut. Ryuga spoke up, his voice shaking with fear as he backed away from where Hinata lay unconscious. You monster. Naruto tilted his head as he said in a distorted voice. The same voice that had come from the being behind him before. Monster am I? This coming from the boy who wanted to kill someone because he might be related to someone else. Denji managed to recover enough to spit out a barrage of pebbles at Naruto's back. As they flew, they grew to the size of Naruto Tozo. But without even looking at him, Naruto dodged perfectly around each boulder. After the barrage ended, Naruto turned and grinned at Tenji. In a blur of motion, Naruto once again vanished, this time reappearing in front of Tenji. Naruto reached out with a hand that became black as night and grabbed Tenji's right arm and with a snap, broke it in three different places. As Tenji screamed in pain, Naruto grabbed the left arm and broke it the same way. He then kicked out, shattering Tenji's kneecap. As the young man fell to the ground screaming. Naruto reached out and grabbed his head with both hands, both of them black, and crushed his skull with ease. At this point, the only one still standing is Ryuga. The one who dared to attack Hinata. Naruto turned his odd eyes towards the man who caused all of this. The demented grin reappeared as he slowly walked towards Ryuga. Now all that is left is you. The one who dared to touch Hinata. Ryuga was unable to move, the killing intent was holding him in place. Naruto grabbed him by the throat and his grip slowly became tighter. Ryuga struggled, trying to escape. Naruto grinned and with a loud snap, Ryuga's existence was snuffed out. Naruto tossed Ryuga to the ground, his neck now at an odd angle. Naruto turned his eyes towards the three unconscious Iwa Genin and began to step forward when a soft voice spoke up. Naruto-kun, don't do it. Naruto froze, the voice cutting through the red haze and the grip of darkness that consumed him. He shook his head as the Bijuu chakra and the image behind him began to fade and disappeared. As it did, Naruto crumbled to the ground unconscious. An unknown location. Naruto awoke to find himself in a dark place. He couldn't see anything further than three meters away. It was at this point that the distorted voice he had heard before everything went black spoke up. You know, I've wanted to talk to you for a while, Naruto. Naruto turned to see a young man who was wearing the same clothes as him, just with inverted colors and missing the scarf. But he couldn't see his face, as it was covered by a white and red kitsu mask that seemed to have taken the place of the scarf. The masked young man leaned forward, and the kitsu mask seemed to grin. It's so nice to see my light half. Naruto looked at the reverse-colored young man and asked the question that he had been curious about for a while. Who exactly are you? The young man pushes up his mask to reveal his own face. The difference was that the whites of his eyes were black and his pupils were blood red. I'm part of you Naruto, you can call me Yami. I'm formed from your negative emotions and your darker instincts. You may call me Yami. Yami bowed to him cheekily. 
Naruto frowned and asked the two things that were on his mind. How exactly do you exist, and why are you appearing before me, now of all times? Yami grinned before putting his mask back in place. It's because you're a Jinchuruki. A side effect of housing a Biju is the fact the vessel's darkness and light will be separated. This is meant as a trial for later on. As for why I appeared, well that bastard hurt Hinata. This caused you to awaken quite a bit of power which overwhelmed you. I took control of the body to deal with them. Naruto dropped into a defensive position. You're not planning to try and take control of my body from me are you? Yami raised his hands in surrender. Ah, don't worry, I only took control so they couldn't escape. If it was before the exams, I might have fought you for control. But now, I actually like your new attitude. You've started to accept your negative emotions. You've stopped burying them. You've started to accept that it is normal to feel hate, anger, sadness. That means you've begun to accept me. Naruto slid out of his fighting stance. So what exactly does that mean? Are we going to fuse together? Yami shook his head before sitting down. Sadly not yet. You need to be at a certain location to be able to do that for some reason. No reason I am here is to talk to you about the two powers you awakened. What powers did I awaken? That's when a bright light blinded them both and they found themselves in the garden that represented Naruto's mindscape. It was at that point that Kurama's voice sounded. The two new powers you awakened were Haki and your Keke Genkai. Naruto was surprised, he knew he would eventually awaken. But the second part shocked him. I have a Keke Genkai. Kurama rested his head on his chin as he said. The Uzumaki clan had multiple unique Keke Genkai. Your mother was able to command golden chains that sealed away chakra. They were even able to restrain me. Then what's my Keke Genkai? Kurama's gaze became far away, as if he was looking past them. Your Keke Genkai is the strongest one the Uzumaki clan has. A Keke Genkai that only two others have awakened. It is called Avatar. What does it do? Kurama shook his head. I do not know. Each Avatar is different. The first user, Shanks Uzumaki's avatar, was able to knock out those weaker than him and put a pressure on those as stronger stronger than him. Axel Uzumaki's avatar allowed him complete immunity and control over all forms of fire. The only common factor between all avatars that have appeared so far is the fact they are somehow tied to nature chakra. I am not quite aware of what your ability is, sadly. Yami leaned forward, resting his chin on his hand as he said. What the great fluffy demon didn't mention is, even though you have awakened it, your body isn't quite strong enough to use it. Yami made air quotes when he said the word demon. Garama growled. I am not fluffy. Yeah yeah, keep telling yourself that fluffy. Yami turned back to Naruto as he said. I could sense that the avatar was incomplete. I'm almost certain that it's not supposed to just hover behind you. It feels like it's supposed to cover you like a cloak. I'm almost certain it was because you aren't strong enough to use it. Naruto raised his hand and asked something he had been curious about for a while. Yami, why are you wearing a kitsune mask? The kitsune mask seemed to grin mockingly at Naruto as Yami said. Because I like it. What, you jealous? Naruto just stared at Yami with a blank face. Yami launched for a bit before he said. It's your mindscape Naruto, you control it. Since I'm part of you, I have limited control. I didn't want to wear the scarf, so I went with a mask. Yami tilted his head as he said. I like the hat though, you really know how to pick a good hat. I feel like a real dandy man. So we have no clue what my avatar actually does. Karama shook his head as he rumbled. No, and I suggest not experimenting with it for at least two years. When I say you're too weak, I mean your body is not developed enough to handle it. It shouldn't have awakened yet, but your anger awakened it. Give it about two years for your body to develop some more, and you should be able to use it. Also, you using some of my chakra weakened the seal, so you should be able to hear me clear. Naruto noticed everything had started to become blurry. Yami laughed with his weird etchy voice as he said. Looks like you're waking up Naruto. I look forward to our next chat. I especially look forward to the day that we are once again Naruto. Garama shot Naruto a fanged grin. Good luck on the rest of the Naruto exam. With those words everything went dark for Naruto. 30 minutes after he blacked out. When Naruto's consciousness began to come back. Even with his eyes closed, he could see things around him. He could see that he was resting in the lap of a lavender-colored figure that shone with a strong yet gentle light. While across from him was a blue figure with multiple black dots rushing throughout. Could this be his that means that the lavender-colored figure is Hinata? Well the blue one is Shino. It was Shino's voice that he heard first. How is he doing Hinata? I think he's coming around. Naruto-kun, are you awake? Naruto opened his eyes then closed it, his eyes burning from the light. Apparently his head was on Hinata's lap. Yeah I'm awake. How long have I been unconscious? What he had been able to see was the fact Hinata was no longer covered in blood and apparently had changed her blouse. Hinata rubbed his hair as she said. 
Naruto-kun, you've been unconscious for 30 minutes. Do you remember what happened? Naruto thought for a few moments before he said. It was like I couldn't control myself, but yes I remember everything. Are you okay Hinata-chan? Hinata nodded. The cut wasn't as deep as it seemed, it just knocked me off balance. When I came to I made sure to check on you then I healed myself. There's not even a scar. Although the clothes I was wearing were ruined. Naruto sat up slowly, but it was at that moment he noticed something. Have either of you seen my hat? Shino handed the hat over to Naruto before asking. What was that chakra you emitted from Naruto? Naruto was quiet for a few moments as he put on his hat and checked his clothes. There was no blood, he could only assume it was because of Kurama's chakra. After a few moments Naruto made a decision and asked. Shino, what do you know about Jinchuruki? I can't say I have ever heard the term before. Naruto looked away as he said. Jinchuruki are those who have had a biju sealed inside them. We act as living storage scrolls to contain the biju. On the day I was born Kaiubi attacked the village, and the fourth was forced to use the only newborn available at the time, me. He sealed Kaiubi inside me. Shino pushed up his glasses as he said. This is why most of the adults in the village treat you badly, correct? Naruto nodded as he stared off into the distance, his mind lost in thought. Shino spoke up once more. You are not too different from the Aburama clan. We are hosts for a hive on insects. But this doesn't make us an insect. Just like you are not the biju you hold. Naruto nodded with a smile as he said. Thanks Shino. Did you two already get the tokens? Hinata nodded. Yes, they had 11 tokens in all. 4 star tokens, 5 moon tokens, and 2 sun tokens. From what we could tell, it was all 7 Iwa teams that attacked. Most of them were either caught or killed by your seals Naruto-kun. Naruto shook his head. I can really understand what pervy sage means by the cycle of hatred now. After a few moments of silence he turns to his two teammates and says. We should hurry to the top now. The longer we stay, the more likely we are to get attacked again. Two days later, the top of the mountain. The maid arrived at what looked like the entrance to a temple. The door was locked, and on the door were three slots. Over each slot was a grayed out symbol of a token. Naruto pulled out three tokens and began to slip them into the slots. As he did, each symbol began to glow. The star glowed bronze, the sun glowed gold, and the moon glowed silver. Once they were all glowing, the door opened up. As they walked into the room, there was a sign that read. Place the signal scroll into the holder. Under the scroll was a podium that looked like the scroll needed to be rolled out on. Naruto stepped forward and did it. As he did the symbols began to glow and with a puff of smoke, Kurenai appeared. She smiled at the three as she said. Good job guys, you were the fourth team to arrive. I'll escort you three to your rooms, you have two more days before this exam ends. As she led them down the hall, Naruto asked a question that was on all three of their minds. Who else has passed this round Kurenai sensei Well the first team was the Suna siblings team. Second was Akumo team, and yesterday team 9 arrived. Naruto grinned when he heard that the Suna siblings were here. After we get shown to our rooms, I'm going to go find Gara. I haven't seen him in a while. Naruto had spent the last two days trying to get used to his new sense. He no longer got a headache when surrounded by life, but it was still disconcerting at times. Luckily he had managed to get it to the point he would only see auras when his eyes were closed. As he spoke he closed his eyes for a few seconds and could see Kurenai sensei's life aura. It was a deep red and seemed to constantly flicker as if it would disappear. They soon arrived at the room where they would be staying. It had three beds, with the third bed being in a screened off location. Most likely for Hinata. Moment he entered the room Naruto headed for his bed and laid on it. This is a good bed. I claim this one. Kurenai just shook her head seeing the blonde's antics. Hinata giggled and Shino went over to the other bed. Naruto slowly stood up. Well I'm going to go find Gara. Hinata who had put her scrolls on her bed, leaned her head from behind the screen section and said. I want to come alone with you. Just give me a couple minutes of Naruto come. Naruto sat back down on his bed and decided to wait. After a couple minutes Hinata came out from the screen and the two headed out of the room. After 10 minutes of searching, they managed to find the Suna team. Naruto grinned as he saw them and closed his eyes for a few moments. Tamari's aura was green and kept moving. Kenkuro's was purple and seemed like it wanted to stretch out and connect to something. While Gara's was brown and seemed to constantly shift, almost like sand being blown by the wind. Gara turned when he sensed someone coming up behind them. He smiled when he saw who it was. Naruto, it is good to see you again. Naruto grinned back as he took Gara's hand. I agree Gara. it's good to see you. I hope Shukaku isn't causing as many issues as before. Gara shook his head. No, after Jiraiya-san took care of the seal he hasn't been bothering me as much. He spends most of his time sleeping. The one time we talked, he claimed that he wouldn't let me sleep because, and I quote. 
If I am not allowed to sleep because of that shit seal, then neither are you. Either way, it's nice to be able to sleep again. Naruto shook his head. Well nice to know you can sleep again. Do you happen to know where the cafeteria is? I was hoping to get something to eat before heading off to get some sleep. Ara smiled. We were heading that way, follow us. Two days later, main room. Yujito stood in the main room. In front of her were the four teams that had managed to pass. Yujito stepped forward as she said. Congratulations for completing the second round of the exams. The third round will take place and the wreckage would be explaining this, but sadly he is stuck trying to keep Killer B from crashing this meeting. In a month you will all meet at Kumo's Thunderdome. There you will be competing in a tournament. Now before you go, you will have to draw lots. She pointed at a box on a table nearby. Now you will all walk up and draw a lot. This will decide the order of the tournament. After a few minutes, they had all drawn their lots. Yujito, who had been riding on a clipboard, held it up. Here are the tournament matches. Match 1. Naruto Uzumaki vs. Rock Lee. Match 2. Gara Sabaku vs. Shino Aviram. Match 3. Kenkuro Sabaku vs. Niji Hayuga. Match 4. Samui vs. Tenten Higurashi. Match 5. Amoi vs. Tamari Sabaku. Match 6. Hinata Yul vs. Kari. Match 7. Three-way battle between victors of first three matches. Match 8. Three-way battle between victors of the last three matches. Match 9. Winner of match 7 versus winner of match 8. Yujito put away the clipboard. Now your sensei will escort you to the cable cars that will take you back to the base of the mountain. I look forward to seeing you all in a month. Three hours later, at the base of the mountain. Gurunai looked at her team as she said. Okay, so we have a month for training. Shino, since your father was one of the escort shinobi he will be training you. Hinata, you will be training with me. Naruto, Jiraiya sent a message, you're going to be training with Kakashi this month. Don't worry, Kakashi plans to take it seriously. You are to meet him at the Raymond stand in Kumo's main plaza tomorrow at noon. When he told me this message he told me to stress that he would actually be on time. Naruto looked at Kurenai in shock. Kurenai nodded. I know, shocking. But don't worry, when he actually says he will be on time, he usually keeps his word. Kurenai looked at the three before she said. Now I just want to say I'm proud of all three of you. I expect you to do your best in the final part. Now you all have the rest of the day off. With that, the team went their separate ways. Shino went to find his father, Kurenai to go talk to Asuma, and Naruto and Hinata decided to spend time together. The next day. Naruto sat in the Raymond stand in the main plaza of Kumo. He was currently waiting for Kakashi to arrive. As he waited he finished his tenth bowl of Raymond. That's when the voice sounded behind him. I see you can still put away as much Raymond as ever Naruto. Naruto turned and smiled as he said. It's good to see you Kakashi-sensei. It's really nice that you arrived on time. Kakashi gave him an eye smile. He was happy that Naruto didn't hold a grudge against him. Well I'm looking forward to training you for the next month. I want to make up for being a bad teacher before. Naruto grinned as he said. Then how about we finish lunch, then we can get to one of the training grounds granted to us. Kakashi nodded as he sat down. Sounds like a plan to me. Amic 1, the first special trap, the Teletubbies torture. The Iwa teams had separated into seven teams and were coming at the circle from all directions to block off an escape. The Genin with a broken nose was leading his team's entrance from the northeast. As they were within 50 meters of the circle everything went black. The group soon found themselves in a meadow with rolling hills. It was still dark, but the sun was rising. In front of them was a large hill with a door in it. They heard a small laugh, they looked up and to their shock, found that the sun was a baby's head. It was at that moment that some upbeat music began to play. As it played a voice spoke up. Over the hills and far away, Teletubbies come to play. That's when four furry creatures came out of the door in the hill and began to skip around them. Each was a different color. There was a green one, a yellow one, a red one, and a purple one. One, one. Two, two. Three, three. Four, four. Teletubbies. Time for Teletubbies. Time for Teletubbies. Time for Teletubbies. The four creatures stopped and began to dance in place. The song continued. Tinky Winky. The purple one raised its arms and shouted Tinky Winky. Tipsy. The green one spun around as it spoke Tipsy. Lala. The third one jumped as it said with a high-pitched voice. Lala. Ho. The red one pointed at them as it said in a surprisingly deep voice. Po. They started dancing again as the song resumed. Teletubbies. Teletubbies. Say, he elo. Ayo. The song kept going on and on, after the song ended it would begin once again. After an hour of this, the poor Genin was curled into a bowl whimpering. They would be found a few days later by Killer B, while still under the effects of the. When he freed them, the three clung to him claiming he was their savior. 
Amic 2, the second special trap, Slender Nova. An Iwagenin team moved in from the southwest. One of them, a young man with brown hair named Taki, stepped on a certain patch of ground. It was then everything went dark for him. Suddenly words appeared before them welcome to sender the eight pages. Taki looked at the words and said to his team. I have a bad feeling about this. Highly recommended that timestamps are read in Spongebob narrator voice. Five minutes later. When Taki's sight cleared he found himself alone in a forest. In front of him was a clearing with what looked like party decorations. At that moment an ominous voice sounded and a tall pale man with no face wearing a suit appeared. Welcome to my party. Taki slowly backed away from the weird cackling man. He walked through the woods and soon found a page on a tree that read. Why did you leave me? Taki nodded as he looked at the page. Now I have a page. Suddenly the voice from the clearing sounded from behind him. Now I know which one you are because everyone else has zero. Taki stiffened as he felt the cold presence behind him and said. Fuck. Five minutes later. Taki was running through the forest, the presence following him. Taki. Go away. What was that about a party? I don't want to go to a party. What was that about a party and ice cream? Leave me alone, I don't want any ice cream. What was that about a party? Taki who was now hiding in a tunnel said. You don't even know where I am. The voice now muffled answered. I know exactly where you are. Really? Then describe it. The voice answered with a weird accent. Eh, tunnel. Fuck. The insane cackling sounded behind him. Taki took off running, only to see the man standing before him, tentacles coming from his back. The man laughed once more as he said. I shall spare your life this time. But I'll be back. Taki who was now curled in a ball said. Fuck. I will let you hear the deaths of your friends, one by one. The man raised his arms as he said. You will hear their screams. Please don't kill my friends. You will hear their screams. But those words he disappeared leaving Taki curled in a ball on the ground. Fuck. Chapter 8, The Finals. It was the day of the finals and all 12 hopefuls were standing in the arena. In front of them was a man with shoulder-length blonde hair and violet eyes. He was looking at the cage box where the rakage and they were sitting. They hadn't been picked yet, thus the team sensei, Baki, was sitting with the rakage and as the representative from Sunagakur. The rakage stood up and spoke with a loud voice. We all know what we're here for. So let the exam finals begin. The blonde-haired referee stepped forward as he said while holding a few injutsu-enhanced microphone. Hello everyone, I am the referee for today's matches. My name is Q. Now all combatants except Naruto Uzumaki and Rock Lee, please leave the arena. Soon Naruto and Rock Lee were the only people left in the arena beside Q. Before she had left, Hinata had given him a kiss on the cheek for luck. Q walked between them as he announced. The first battle of the Kumo Chunin finals. Are both combatants ready? Naruto drew Shinjetsu and slid into his starting stance. I'm ready. Rock Lee got into his stance as well. I am ready as well. Q grinned before he said. Begin. And jumped away from the arena, landing on top of the wall. Rock Lee looked at Naruto as he said. Shall we show the audience our flames of youth, my eternal rival? Naruto grinned as he said. Yes, now come at me Lee. Rock Lee grinned before taking off his weights and tossing them away. He knew they would be no use in the coming battle. They formed twin craters where they landed. Moments after they landed, Rock Lee charged at Naruto in a green blue and threw a punch at his chest. Naruto slowly moved out of the way, using minimal movement to dodge the attack. As he did he struck out with his right leg, attempting to kick Lee in the stomach, only for the green-clad boy to block it with one of his legs. The two began to launch high-speed attacks at each other. Naruto using kicks and sword slashes. While Lee made use of kicks and punches. They were moving at such high speeds that they were a blur to the civilian spectators. As Naruto deflected another punch with his left leg. Shinjetsu began to glow gold, the aura covering Naruto's body before he stepped back then flipped into the air. Meteor shower as he was in the air Shinjetsu was thrust forward, becoming a blur of stabs at Rock Lee. Who was forced to dodge multiple golden glowing thrusts. Rock Lee was forced to flip away before he stopped around 10 meters away from Naruto. Naruto landed on the ground and kept his eyes on Lee. Lee grinned and gave Naruto a thumbs up. Yosh, Naruto, your flames of youth are burning extremely brightly. I must match your flames intensity. Lee crouched down as he yelled out. Kamen, gate of opening, open. A burst of chakra was released from Lee's body. Naruto frowned, this would be the true test of his training. Lee didn't know the meaning of the word hold back. The fact he was opening the gates, something he only did when Guy sensei gave him permission, proved this. Most likely Guy had given him permission beforehand. Naruto knew that Lee could open five gates, he had actually seen him open the gates before. During a spar with him. He still got shivers remembering it. Luckily Lee had only gone up to three gates when he did it. 
he just hoped his hockey would be up to the task. Because he knew once he opened more gates he would have a harder time keeping up, even with what he was about to do. Lee rushed at him so quickly he almost disappeared. It was only the warning from his hockey that allowed Naruto to dodge out of the way. Naruto kept dodging around each attack by mere inches. He grit his teeth as he realized he had to take a gamble. He made sure to dodge a little late so that Rock Lee's kick connected, sending him into the air. As he flew up, his grip loosened on Shinjetsu, making the sentient blade fall to the ground, blade first. Lee kicked him higher three times before unleashing his bandages and wrapping him up tightly covering him up to his face with the bandages. But that Lee quickly pulled the blonde towards the ground and at the last second he released him and jumped away, sending Naruto crashing into the ground, causing a large crater to appear and dust to obscure him. What Lee didn't notice was that as he let go, Naruto's face became a shiny black color. No one was expecting what happened next. Naruto's voice sounded out as the dust cloud slowly cleared. Damn, that would have seriously hurt me if I hadn't defended myself. The dust cloud cleared, revealing Naruto dusting off his clothes. He reached down and pulled Shinjetsu out of the ground. Shall we continue, Lee? Yosh, your flames of youth burn brighter than ever. Lee crouched down once more as he shouted out. Kaiman, gate of healing, Saiman, gate of life, open. With that, Lee's hair stood on end and his skin turned red. Naruto grinned as he held up his arms. I guess I need to level the playing field a bit. He made a hand sign before shouting out. Kai. With that, golden bands of kanji appeared on his limbs and torso before disappearing. The two disappeared and all that was heard was the sound of clashing attacks. Only the end could keep up, along with a few of the hopefuls. Suddenly there was a crash as something hit the wall. It was revealed to be Naruto who pulled himself out of the wall. As he stood up Rock Lee had stopped and was gathering his energy for his next attack. Naruto grimaced as he said. Erg, I didn't want to have to use this yet. Naruto sheathed Shinjetsu before he coated his right leg in chakra. He set his chakra-clad foot on the ground and began to spin at high speeds. When he stopped he lifted his now glowing leg. The foot of the devil, Diable Jam. The heat I generated from all that spinning will burn my kick straight through you. Now shall we see what is stronger, the flames of hell or the eight inner gates. Flashback, during training. Naruto set his foot down, his face set in a grimace from the burns he had sustained with the newly learned Diable Jam. A couple days ago, he had managed to finally ignite his chakra so he could use the technique. Kakashi, who was leaning against a tree, sent him an eye smile. So it seems currently your limit for that technique is 5 kicks a day. It also seems you can't actually put said leg down while it's active or the chakra runs out into the ground. Kakashi gestured to the ground where a huge scorch mark had been burned into the ground by the chakra running off. We'll need to work on that as well as the number of kicks you can use with it. The Diable Jam was an exceedingly dangerous technique for both the user and the one who it was used on. By coating the user's legs in chakra before spinning at high speed, they can ignite their legs with extremely hot flames. These flames increase the power of the user's kicks, but at a price. If the user overuses said technique in the earlier stages, they can do irreparable harm to their leg. But the risks do not come without reward. If the user masters the Diable Jam, they will gain an immunity to fire, thus allowing the user to use Diable Jam without any risk. Present time. Naruto launched himself forward, his foot lancing out, just as Lee raced towards him. Naruto's kick just barely missed Lee, it grazed his side, burning his jumpsuit. Lee managed to ignore it and kick Naruto hard into the air, the preparation steps for the hidden lotus were ready. He began to kick and punch Naruto through the air at high speeds. Naruto grit his teeth and used hockey to cushion the blows. As Lee kicked and punched him, he opened the fourth and fifth gate. As he was about to make the final blow through, Naruto managed to block said attack with a kick. Naruto grinned before grabbing Lee's arm as he said. Sorry Lee, you lose. Naruto's glowing leg began to swing towards Lee who was being held in place. Diable jam. Flammage shot. Devil's leg. Flam shot. His foot connected with Lee and with a grunt of exertion, Naruto sent Lee rocketing towards the ground. When Lee landed he made a massive crater. This new crater put the one Naruto had made earlier to shame. Naruto landed on the ground, scorching the earth as the heat bled from his glowing leg. The dust cleared to show Rock Lee was unconscious, with a huge burn mark on his side. Q jumped into the arena and checked Lee's pulse before saying. Rock Lee is unable to continue, the winner by knockout, Naruto Uzumaki. Naruto grinned as he said. It looks like it's 10-9, my favorite Lee. With those words Naruto walked towards the corridor that led to the contestant box. The rakage whistled. God damn Jiraiya, you got a pair of monsters there. Jiraiya laughed as he said. Rock Lee is my guy's apprentice. Well Naruto is mine. He's also been trained by Kakashi. Kakashi wanted to make it up to him by dropping the bowl right after Naruto became a genin. Oddly enough when Kakashi gets motivated, he's a pretty good teacher. 
Aki leaned forward to watch the medics take Rock Lee to the infirmary. Luckily Tsunade had agreed to help with healing the contestants, so there wouldn't be long-term damage hopefully. They're both easily skilled. That boy Rock Lee is reckless though, he fell right into Naruto's trap. Your apprentice is quite clever Jiraiya-sama. Jiraiya nodded. Naruto has already had a bit of a talent for figuring out ways to defeat his opponents. He once stabbed a kunai through his own and his opponent's hand to hold them in place before striking them with a finishing blow. The frowned as he said. That sounds rather reckless. If he wasn't the Jinchuriki of Kaiubi I would have called him insane. And noticed Jiraiya looking at him and waved it off. I have two Jinchuriki who are completely in harmony with their biju. Yujito told me that Matatabi had sensed Kaiubi and Naruto. Jiraiya nodded. You're right, it was reckless. But the shinobi he was fighting was level, elite level in fact. But the ingenin. Light guy hung his head. It is such a shame that Lee lost to Naruto. But Naruto's flames of youth are burning brighter than ever. You did an excellent job training him this past month Kakashi. Kakashi looked at Guy with a bored look on his face. What did you say Guy? Sadly the bored expression was ruined by the fact he was putting his hit I ate back down. Guy didn't seem to notice as he clenched his fist and grit his teeth. Damn your hit ways Kakashi. Kakashi said after fixing his hit I ate. I didn't teach him any of that though. But I'm pretty sure how he escaped the primary lotus was something we worked on over the past month. Gurunai turned back to look at the two as she asked. What was it, Kakashi? I barely noticed thanks to my Sharingan. But at the last moment Lee let go of Naruto to drive him into the ground. Naruto's head turned a shiny black. That's a sign of hockey. He must have used hockey to absorb the impact. I looked at Kakashi in shock as he said. Naruto has already learned hockey. Apparently his team was ambushed in the Thunder Peaks and it caused him to awaken his hockey. I nodded. That would make sense. Hockey is willpower given form. Asuma, who had stayed with his team to support the other two teams, asked a question in the genin's mind. What does Haki do exactly? I spoke slowly. Haki is a power that was said to exist before chakra. As I said before, it is willpower given form. Those who have Haki can sense the intent of others, allowing them to dodge incoming attacks, even if said attack comes from their blind spot. It also allows them to coat their body and weapons in a black armor, which can increase damage and allow them to touch things that normally can't be touched. Bakashi nodded. What guy said is true. It was quite annoying sparring with him, he would be able to dodge all my surprise attacks, and he kicked apart a fireball. The Kurinai, Asuma, and the Genin of Team 10 looked at Kakashi in shock. Shikamaru spoke up. Troublesome, so what you're saying is Naruto is now able to destroy. It was only a C rank, but Yahaki allows him to do that. Asuma put out his cigarette as he said. So what did you all work with him on? Well I helped him work on his nature manipulation. I also taught him several ninjutsu of each of his natures. I taught him the body flicker, improved his ability to use the Rasengan, and a few other things. Asuma looked at him like he had grown three more heads. How did you teach him all that? Bakashi chuckled. Lots and lots of shadow clones. I might have ended up increasing my own chakra pool trying to keep up with him. Back in the arena. Hugh spoke up. Will Gara Sabaku of Sunagakur and Shino Aburam of Konohagakur please enter the arena? The two genin entered the ring. Shino knew he couldn't win. He was just hoping to drain some chakra and weaken Gara enough for the semi-finals. He also hoped that Naruto would gain enough information from this fight to win the semi-finals. He raised his hand. Are both contestants ready? The two stoic individuals just nodded. Then let the second match begin. With those words he once again fled to the top of the arena wall. The cork on Gara's gourd flew off and sand settled around him, just as Shino raised his arm releasing a cloud of insects. The Aburamare charged forward, the insects flowing after him. He dodged around some sand shuriken launched by Gara and threw a fist at the redhead. Sand rose up to meet him, but Shino was expecting that. He slipped some insects into the sand with each strike before jumping back. Gara sent multiple waves of sand at him, which he barely managed to dodge. He waved his arm, and a ball of insects was fired back at Gara, who blocked them with a sand shield. Shino smiled behind his collar. Good, it's going well. It was at that moment that Gara lost control of the sand that he had been blocking the attacks with. Gara's eyes went wide as he felt the connection to the sand be cut off. What? Shino smiled as he held up a beetle on his finger. These aren't normal kakechu, parasitic destruction insects. These are a special subspecies of kakechu. This breed of kakechu are able to devour only a single nature of chakra, in exchange for that, they are able to do it at 10 times the speed of the normal kakechu. They also gain an immunity to said chakra nature. The nature of these kakechu eat is earth. It also means you can't destroy them with your sand. It was like his battle against Naruto all over again. If he held back he wouldn't be able to win against Shino. I see, then I will have to go all out. 
Gara lifted his hand and almost all the sand that was laying at his feet rose and began to rush at Shino. Sand coffin Shino was forced to dodge and avoid the sand attacks for two minutes. But when hands made of sand appeared beneath him and grabbed him, Shino was quickly caught and engulfed in sand. Gara spoke as he lifted up the restrained Shino. As he did this he had his remaining sand quickly creating more sand for his use. Please surrender, I would rather not have to suffocate a friend of Naruto's. Shino shook his head in answer. Before Gara could completely cover his face, Shino collapsed into more that quickly infected the sand, making it useless. Gara heard a sound behind him, and his shield blocked another strike at him, he turned to see the real Shino jumping back. An insect clone. He barely took notice of his sand falling limply to the ground. Shino nodded calmly, while on the inside he was nervous, he was running low on chakra. Using the subspecies of Kakechu was extremely draining. He hoped that what he had done so far would help Naruto out. Gara frowned, it seemed he couldn't rely on his sand much right now. He would have to reveal it. He began to go through hand signs. Wine style. Great breakthrough. With that he waved his arm, releasing a massive blast of wind that sent Shino flying back. Shino managed to maneuver himself so that he landed on his feet, with some chakra he stopped skidding pretty quickly. I didn't know you used anything other than your sand Gara san Well when you face Naruto and that talking sword of his, you tend to learn a few new tricks. Shino pushed back up his sunglasses which were slipping a little low. Let me guess, you learned them to help you counter Shinjetsu. Gara nodded. Yes, Shinjetsu did exactly what your Kakechu did. So shall we begin the real battle. Shino raised his hand as he said. Referee I surrender. If Gara had eyebrows, he would have raised one. Shino just looked at him for a few moments as Q announced the winner. Once he did, the two of them left as they did, he said. The entire reason I was facing you was so Naruto could gather information for the next battle. I can't win against you, as my Kakechu refuses to eat your chakra directly. I was stuck on defense, and the moment you revealed you could use wind ninjutsu, I had no choice but to surrender. Fair enough. Q's voice sounded through the stadium once again. Will Kankuro Sabaku of Sunagakur and Niji Hayuga of Kanahagakur please enter the arena? In cage box. Aki spoke up. The Aburam boy did quite well facing Gara. Gareya nodded as he said. Shino is a natural strategist, the only one better at planning out strategies in their class is Shikamaru. It likely helped that Shino was part of the team sent to stop Gara during the invasion. He was the one who defeated Kankuro. Aki flinched when the invasion was brought up. I was against the invasion. Rasa-sama should have just discussed things with Hiruzen-sama. I shook his head. Rasa was never too smart. I might be short-tempered, but I can't understand what the point of that was. Most of the elemental nations had heard about the failed invasion. Aki, desperate to change the subject, pointed to the arena. It looks like the next fighters have entered the ring. The arena. Niji and Kankuro stood across from each other. Kankuro had already unsealed his two puppets for the match. One was a three-eyed puppet with multiple limbs, crow. The other had a long head with horns, black ant. Kankuro grinned as he said. It seems we got to have our match that I had to surrender in the last exams Hayuga-san. Niji gave a small smile. Yes you could say it's our fate to face each other. Unless you feel like surrendering again. Kankuro shook his head. Nope, I am either going to win this match, or I'm going to go down like a true shinobi, by taking you with me. He raised his hand. Are both fighters ready? After getting the confirmation he said, let the third match of the exam finals begin. He once again fled to his safe space. Moment it began Kankuro launched Crow forward, the puppet flying at Niji with blades exposed. Niji dodged around the attacks from the puppet. Each of the puppet's movements were quick, but mechanical. Niji thrust out a finger coated in chakra and cut through a chakra thread. He kept doing this to try and cut Kankuro's connection to Crow. But Kankuro repaired the threads each time he severed one. With a twitch of his left hand Black Ant rushed forward at Niji. Niji was now facing a battle on two fronts as each puppet attacked from a different direction. What made it worse was that Niji couldn't really parry the blades for fear of getting poisoned. So he was forced to dodge each attack. Black Ant swung at Niji while Crow came in the exact opposite direction, making it impossible for Niji to fully dodge. He had no choice but to reveal it. He began to pivot on one foot as his skin glowed with chakra. Rotation. A spinning dome of chakra appeared around him, forcing both puppets back. Ankuro whistled. So that's the famous rotation of the Hayuga clan. I didn't know they taught it to the branch family. Niji smiled. I learned it through watching the main family. It took me close to three months to recreate it perfectly. But it's not all I've managed to recreate. He then crouched down as a yin-yang symbol appeared beneath him. You're in range of my divination. 8 trigrams, 64 palms. Niji rushed forward before Kankuro could react and began to attack him. 2 palms. 4 palm. 8 palm. 
16 palms, 32 palms, 64 palms. Kankura was blown back by the fierce assault on him. But he had a trump card. As he was thrown back he activated the hidden chakra storage seal on his left palm, and his chakra string sprang to life. Before Niji could react he was grabbed by the black ant, which had appeared in his blind spot, and pulled into its open chest compartment. But the flick of Kankuro's fingers, the inside of black ant was filled with a paralyzing poison. As Kankuro lay on the ground he smirked as he said. I told you I would take you down with me. With those words he passed out, Niji trapped inside black ant and unable to move. He reappeared in the arena as he checked Kankuro, he then checked on Niji by using his senses. He could tell that Niji was alive, but paralyzed. Both fighters are unable to continue. This match is a draw. In the cage box. Ureya was looking at the arena in confusion. How did Kankuro do that? His chakra was sealed off. Aki smiled as he raised his palm. Kankuro has a pair of chakra storage seals on his palms. They can be seen if he doesn't activate them, and he doesn't need chakra to activate them. He can use them in an emergency to power his chakra threads. Since Niji let his guard down, Kankuro was able to trap him. He laughed as he said. I think the Kankuro kid is material. The Hyuga I'm not so sure about. Although I will admit he's talented, I mean recreating the Hyuga clan's most famous techniques just by watching them be used. That's some scary good talent right there. Hiraya nodded. I agree with you I wonder who will win the next match. The arena. Will Samui of Kumagakur and Tenten Higurashi of Kanahagakur please enter the arena? When the blonde-haired Genin of Kumo and the brown-haired Genin with twin buns arrived in the arena, Q raised his hand. Are both fighters ready? After getting confirmation he said. Let the fifth match of the exam finals begin. Samui drew her tanto and stood ready to face her opponent. Tenten grinned as she pulled out a scroll and unsealed a pair of combat daggers. The two began to slowly circle each other, weary of what the other handed up their hands. After a few moments Tenten rushed forward and thrust one of her daggers forward. Samui parried the strike with her tanto and spun slightly to push the dagger past her. Tenten's other dagger came flashing up but was blocked by Samui's tanto. Suddenly the tanto began to glow blue, and much to Tenten's shock, the dagger was quickly cut in half. She was forced to jump back to avoid getting stabbed. Tenten frowned. I should have expected a lightning affinity. I guess I'll have to unveil the big gun sooner than I planned. She unsealed two large scrolls. Before she could unravel it Samui raced through hand signs. Not if I can help it. Lightning style. Flash pillar. Samui's body released an extremely bright light that blinded Tenten, but it cleared pretty quickly, and Tenten saw Samui racing towards her. Oh no you don't. Tenten placed the scrolls at her side as she quickly raced through the hand signs and jumped into the air. As she jumped into the air, the scrolls unraveled and spun around her. Twin rising dragons. With that she unleashed a barrage of various weapons onto Samui. After a couple minutes Samui was on the ground unconscious and bleeding. Tenten landed on the ground and closed her scrolls. It was at that moment she felt a sharp pain on the back of her neck, and everything went dark. As she fell, the Samui that was unconscious on the ground disappeared with a glimmer. The real Samui stood over Tenten. Lucky B-sensei got C-sensei to teach me Jinjutsu. I would have had a hard time dodging all those weapons. Hugh checked on Tenten. Winner by knockout, Samui. In the cage box. Gurey aside. That was a pretty sad display from Tenten. The chuckled as he said. She's a student of my brother B and my bodyguard C. Baki spoke up. She did good using that, it allowed her to hide her skills for the rest of the battle. The blonde bodyguard of A's chuckled. He had been quite just like the other bodyguards for most of the finals. But now he spoke up. You're quite right, Baki-san. Samui is hiding a lot of her skills. The spoke up. Something I've been curious about, who do you think will be the winner of the finals Jureya, Baki? Baki tapped his legs slowly. I would like to say Gara, but he will have to defeat Naruto first. I don't know how much stronger Naruto has come through since their last fight. Aside as he said. As much as I would like to root for my own Genin, I am only confident in Samui. Her two teammates aren't quite as powerful. Gureya smiled. It will be Naruto and Hinata in the finals, and Naruto will win. Then Baki both turned to him. Baki was the one who asked. Why do you say that Jureya? Naruto is my apprentice, so I know how strong he was before the exams. He trained with Kakashi who trained him pretty well, according to the reports they both sent me. Hinata is Sanadi's apprentice, she's also trained by Kurana Yul and Anko Mitarashi. While she's extremely skilled I am putting money on Naruto beating her. Although, he might surrender since she's his girlfriend. Gureya's guard, the cat, chuckled as she said. I could see that. In the arena. Hugh's voice sounded out once more. Will Amoy of Kumagakur and Tamari Sabaku of Sunagakur please enter the arena? Amoy walked down into the arena. 
Tamari instead jumped out of the fighter box and floated down into the arena on her fan. Amway gulped when he saw that. A battle fan user would be really difficult for him to fight. Are both fighters ready? Both of them gave confirmation Q raised his hand as he said. Let the fifth match of the exam finals begin. He jumped away to his sanctuary on the wall. Amoy drew his katana and charged forward. Tamari swung her fan, releasing a blast of wind at Amoy. The young swordsman rolled out of the way and swung his katana at Tamari, flickering with lightning. Tamari blocked it with a kunai that was glowing green. With a grin she kicked Amoy away and then swung her fan once again, releasing a massive wave of wind that sent Amoy flying. He crashed into the wall hard and was knocked out. Hugh jumped down and checked on him. Winner by knockout. Tamari Sabaku. In cage box. Aside as he fascipumed. Amoy got the worst possible opponent. Hopefully this will make him start to focus on things other than his kinjutsu. Hiraya nodded. I don't think he's quite ready to be yet. I nodded. I agree with you, he focuses too much on kinjutsu without having a backup plan. Kerry is the same. Although according to B, Amoy is the best swordsman out of the three. Aki nodded. Sadly Tamari is also over-specialized. But she is an extremely skilled tactician, so it makes up for it at least a little. In the arena. Will Hinata yell of Kanahagakur and Kari of Kumagakur please enter the arena? Soon Kari and Hinata were in the arena facing each other. Q looked at the two. Are both fighters ready? Kari nodded as she drew her sword, Hinata said with a smile. I am ready for Q-san. Then let the sixth match of the exam finals begin. Kari charged forward and slashed at Hinata. Her blade swung through the air, aiming right for Hinata's neck. Before the blade could reach through there was a clang as it was stopped by a staff that appeared in Hinata's hands. Harry's eyes went wide. This is surprising, a Hayuga who uses more than just the Junkin. Hinata spun her staff one-handed as she said. Apparently I wasn't strong enough to be a Hayuga, so I was banished. No matter how well she hit it, she was still pissed off at the elders for forcing her father to banish her. The only elder she wasn't passed off at was her grandfather who is on her father's side and is against a caged bird seal. Harry frowned for a few seconds before she decided to drop the subject and swung at Hinata again. Hinata deflected the blow with her staff and then thrust out her palm at Kerry, forcing the redhead to backstep to avoid it. The battle evolved into a deadly dance. As each weapon strike was blocked and each palm strike was dodged a battle went on for five minutes. As Kerry backstepped to dodge yet another Juho strike, she was shocked to see the former Hyuga race through hand signs before breaking in deeply. Fire-style fireball with that Hinata released a large fireball that Kerry was forced to dodge. Okay, now I've seen it all. A Hyuga using ninjutsu. I know you were banished, but still I thought that clan taught you all to never use anything but the gentle fist. Hinata gave Kerry a small smile. I don't believe in restricting myself like that. With those words she spun her staff and tried to strike Kerry in the chest, the Kumo Genin blocked the strike with her sword. As she did she was forced to lean to the side to avoid a Juho strike to the shoulder. The two disengaged and Kerry frowned as she said. How is it my sword hasn't cut through your staff yet? I'm channeling lightning chakra through my sword. It wasn't Hinata that answered, but Hinod. Oh I was wondering why I felt tingly every time I struck that sword. Sorry dear but I'm in a completely different league from your sword. Perry stared at the sentient weapon in shock. Did your staff just talk? Hinod responded, her voice just dripping with sarcasm. No, it's just your imagination. Good god I've been spending too much time with Shinjetsu haven't I? Hinata giggled as she said. Don't worry Hinod, you'll always be my partner, even if you become just like Shinjetsu. Hinata quickly leaned back to the point her arms were touching the ground. The reason she had done this was to dodge the strike that came from. Hinata used her hands as a pivot and spun before flipping back away from Kerry. As she did she pulled two things from her pouch with her free hand and threw one of them at Kerry. Perry reacted too late and hissed in pain as there was a piercing pain in her right shoulder, which then went completely limp. She looked at her shoulder embedded in her shoulder as a single. There aren't any nerve clusters there. Her eyes went wide. You managed to hit one of my chakra points with a... Anada smiled as she spun the second that she still held in her hand. It took a while to get it right. But I managed to create a way for the Junkin to be used at long range. Perry pulled her out of her shoulder, but her arm was still limp. Damn it. Perry was forced to block a strike from Hinata's staff with one hand. She didn't know if she could win anymore, she had lost half of her fighting strength with that one move. She grit her teeth, she wasn't going to give up. She parried another strike, she would have to focus on parrying, since she couldn't exactly block with only one hand. Hinata's fingers slipped through her defense and struck the shoulder of her sword hand. Within a second her arm had gone numb, and another strike from Hinod had knocked her sword out of her hand. Before she could react, Hinata's palm was right in front of her. You lose Kerry-san. Perry sighed as she said. 
It's your win Yul san. He reappeared in the arena and said. Winner Hinata Yul. There will now be a 45 minute break before the semi-finals begin. In cage box. Gareya sighed as he rested his head in his hands. Hinata actually managed to finish developing it. That girl is a true prodigy. When the Hyuga clan learn of this, the elders will go mental. He laughed as he said. So the Hyuga banished the girl for being weak, but she has so much potential. That long distance junkin is terrifying. Aki leaned forward as he frowned. I honestly wonder how she did it. From what I heard, the Hyuga had tried for years, but eventually gave up. Gareya nodded. They did, they even tried like Hinata did. She hasn't explained how she did it. Apparently she had gotten the training and their use from Anko. Aki shivered, he had met the snake mistress during his time and Kanoha during the last exam finals. The woman gave him shivers. In the corridor of the stadium, 40 minutes later. Naruto and Hinata were cuddling on a bench. The two had gotten lunch and then had spent the rest of their time just enjoying each other's company. It helped with the anxiety that came from their upcoming matches. Hinata would be facing two others in her match. While Naruto's would be a rematch with Gara, not the most relaxing event. It was Naruto who broke the silence. What do you think of your next match Hinata-chan? It's going to be difficult, but I believe I can win. Tamari will be the bigger problem, simply because of how much damage she can cause with her ninjutsu. What about your match Naruto-kun? Honestly, I wish I was fighting Tamari and Samui instead. Want to trade? Hinata giggled but shook her head. Naruto sighed as he said. I was afraid of that. Honestly, Gara was difficult to fight before and he was practically insane with rage. Now he's covered up his weakness of relying solely on his sand. Yeah this is going to be a difficult fight. It also means most likely you'll get to see some of my new tricks. Hinata smiled as she said. Oh that will make the finals easier. Naruto smirked. Oh don't expect me to let you win. Hinata stuck out her tongue at him cutely in response. She knew he would never let her win a spar, it would be a disservice to both of them. No one got stronger by holding back in a fight. It was at that moment that Q's voice sounded throughout the stadium. The semi-finals will be starting in 5 minutes. Will all fighters please return to the fighter box? Also, will the person in charge of watching over Killer B please report to the front of the stadium, he has escaped confinement. Anada looked up as she said. I really hope that last part was meant as a joke. Naruto chuckled as he said. I actually got to talk to Killer B over the last month. The guy is pretty cool, but apparently A locks him up for the exam. Apparently the one time he didn't, Killer B hijacked the comm system and started rapping. Apparently it was quite the sight to see, A was jazzing him around the arena, B was running and jumping to escape, all the while rapping. For those wondering, sadly I doubt I could do this amok, I suck at rapping. I have a different plan for this chapter's amok. They both stood up as Hinata shook her head. Maybe it's for the best that Killer B is confined, at least until the end of the exams. With those words they headed towards the fighter's box. The arena, five minutes later. Hugh spoke, his voice reaching all corners of the stadium. Now that the break is over, it's time for the semi-final matches. Will Naruto Uzumaki and Gara Sabaku please enter the ring? Gara once again appeared in a whirl of sand. A couple seconds later Naruto appeared in a whirl of flames and wind. Naruto grinned at Gara as he said. It seems someone is eager to have his ass kicked again. Gara returned Naruto's grin with a smile of his own. No, I will be winning this time Naruto-san. Hugh the announcer spoke up. Since you're both ready, let the seventh match of the exam finals begin. The cork on Gara's gourd flew off and sand quickly flew out and settled around him. As it did he went through hand signs before taking in a deep breath. Wine style. Air bullet with it he blew out five small bullets that quickly rushed at Naruto. Naruto responded by drawing Shinjetsu and cutting through the two that would have hit him, dispelling them in the process. Naruto spun Shinjetsu as he smiled. Well, someone's an eager Tanuki. Gara nodded. I will win this match, Naruto-san. With that Gara waved his hand and sent San flying towards Naruto, trying to bind him. Naruto flipped over the sand as he did his sword spun around, slashing through the sand and draining it of chakra quickly. The sand fell to the ground, cut off from Gara's control. Gara managed to keep his eye from twitching at that. It was annoying having his sand taken from him and it had been done by two different people today made it more annoying. Suddenly a sleepy boy sounded in his mind. So the brat with Shinjetsu is fighting us huh? Chukaku, you know that sword. Oh yeah, my dad was the one who made the sword. It's ancient and can drain chakra faster than a sponge soaking up water. Are there any weaknesses? Well, not really. Shinjetsu is specially made to drain chakra. It will even drain your chakra if it cuts you. Hell if someone who he doesn't like holds him, they will be drained of chakra in seconds. As this conversation was going on, Gara was keeping Naruto back with waves of sand and wind attacks. How do I defeat him then? Best bet. 
try and disarm him, Shinjetsu can only drain chakra from a body if they're holding the handle or if they're cut by the blade. Chakra outside the body will be absorbed by just coming near it. Thus your best chance is to try and knock Shinjetsu out of his hand. Honestly, of the four, Shinjetsu is the worst possible one for you to face. After this you really need to get better at Tajutsu or maybe choose a weapon. Ara released a wall of wind to knock Naruto back as he said. Yeah good idea Shukaku. You might want to focus on this fight. I doubt you win, but it doesn't mean you have to make it easy for him. As Gara had been talking to his inner plush toy, Naruto had been dodging an assault of sand and wind. He dodged most of the attacks through aerobatic maneuvers. While the attacks he couldn't dodge he slashed through with Shinjetsu. This had been going on for two minutes now and Naruto was starting to get annoyed. Naruto dodged around the wave of wind and grit his teeth. He had been right, Gara was much harder to battle when he was sane. He needed something long range to punch through Gara's defenses. But the only thing he had was that. Flashback, two weeks ago. Naruto smiled as he held up the. He had masted making the blue spinning ball of doom with one hand. Kakashi gave him an eye smile as he said. Well good job there Naruto. Now you no longer have to use shadow clones to make them. Naruto was watching the spinning sphere when he suddenly had a thought. What if he tried to coat it in? Would it hold it together and allow it to be used at long range? Present time. Naruto held up his hand and quickly formed a. When it was formed everyone in the stadium was shocked to see one of the fourth Hokage's signatures being used by a genin, one who looked like a young Minato Namikaze no less. But they were in for an even bigger shock when Naruto's hand became as black as ebony. Slowly the black coloring spread from his hand to the Rasengan, covering it and engulfing it. Soon what was held in Naruto's hand was a shiny black orb. Naruto grinned as he held the orb in hand. Gara looked on in shock, he didn't know why, but he felt a serious sense of danger from that attack. Naruto threw the orb into the air race and shot. As it came down he spun and kicked it hard towards Gara. Gara quickly put up a heavy defense, which took the form of Shukaku. The race and shot began to slowly grind through the sand before exploding, destroying the sand and blinding everyone with a cloud of sand. Suddenly Gara heard a voice in front of him. It's over Gara. Gara looked down to see Naruto in front of him in an eye-eye stance. Starburst. Naruto drew a shining and began to quickly slash at Gara. Each slash left a glowing line behind. Naruto's strikes were so fast they couldn't be seen, only the glowing lines were seen. Naruto his blade, a glowing kanji for the word star floating in the air, his sand armor almost completely destroyed. Naruto backflipped away and made a hand sign. Katsu. The kanji exploded, sending Gara flying back where he landed on the ground and slowly rolled, he had been knocked out by the final attack. Naruto landed on the ground and sheathed Shinjetsu. He did his best to keep from revealing the toll that his attacks had done to him. His right hand was trembling slightly, he had burned his chakra coils in that hand slightly. Hopefully it would be healed by the time the finals arrived. He wasn't at all used to mixing chakra and together, not to mention using the starburst right after. It was no wonder his arm was damaged. Q checked on Gara before signaling for the medics to take him away. Winner by knockout, Naruto Yuzumaki. In cage box. Aki sighed as he said. Gara put up a good fight, but Yuzumaki-san is one of the worst possible matchups for him. But I was surprised, Yuzumaki-san could use the Rasengan. Gareya nodded. Yep, I taught him how to do it. The4 boy is a prodigy, he managed to learn it in less than a month. I turned to him as he asked. How did he launch it, and what was the black coloring? Gareya frowned as he said. I honestly have no idea. He never showed that during his training with me, most likely it's a new thing. I shook his head. I stand by what I say, that kid is scary. Naruto slowly walked back to the fighter box, trying not to move his arm too much. Kit, you know that was pretty reckless. Ever since the incident on Thunder Peaks a month ago, Kurama has been able to talk to Naruto clearly. He was also able to see and hear what Naruto did. Although the ancient fox still spent most of his time sleeping. Naruto really couldn't blame him at times. Sorry about that Kurama, how bad is the damage? Not too bad, it should be healed by the time the final round starts. It would be healed much quicker if the cage was open. Don't worry Kurama, Pervy Sage said he would give me the key on my birthday. He just needs to negotiate permission to use the Jinchuruki training ground Kumo has. I look forward to it. I will enjoy stretching my legs. Naruto walked into the fighter's box just as Q's voice sounded. Will Samui, Tamari Sabaku and Hinata Yell please enter the arena. Naruto smiled at Hinata as he said. Good luck Hinata-chan. Soon the three Kanoichi were all standing in the arena, arranged in a triangle, making sure their two opponents were in sight. They had all drawn their weapons and were prepared for this battle. Q spoke up. Are all three fighters ready? After getting their confirmation he raised his hand and said, let the eighth match of the exam finals begin. 
After Q left the arena the three kept watching each other, none of them wanting to make the first move. Hinata's Byakugan studied both girls. Tamari is the bigger threat if I leave her alone. I need to take her out first, but I have to be careful that Samui doesn't interfere. Samui watched both her opponents, her tanto held in front of her, ready to parry any strikes. Yol is the bigger threat, but I can't take her down safely with Sabaku still in this match. Her long range would interfere in our battle. I need to take down Sabaku first, then face Yol. Damari was tense, she knew that very likely she would be targeted first. Even if she somehow won this match, she would have to face Naruto. She decided she would try her best to prove herself worthy of being A. Damari was the first to act, with a wave of her fan she sent a blast of wind towards her two opponents. Both jumped out of the way, before rushing towards her. She frowned as she tried to keep distance, releasing blasts of wind and backtracking. The two Kanoichi kept dodging the blasts of wind as they moved towards Tamari. As Tamari was getting ready to fire a blast at Samui. Hinata's hand flickered forward, and Tamari let out a cry of pain as it embedded itself in her right shoulder. Tamari gritted her teeth as she pulled out with her still working hand, sadly this meant she had to drop her large fan. Once the was pulled out she reached into her fan and pulled out a small fan. She wouldn't be able to do as much damage with this. But she would give them both a parting gift before surrendering. She flipped the fan into the air and bit her thumb. When it came back down she grabbed it and opened it, smearing blood on it as she did. She then swung the fan, activating the special seal on it. Summoning. Blade dance. This technique produced a small whirlwind, from which a weasel with a sickle appeared. The weasel began to spin, increasing the whirlwind size and targeting Tamari's two enemies. Samui dodged the whirlwind but not completely. A blade from it managed to hit her right leg, cutting deeply. The whirlwind focused on Hinata though, seeing her as the bigger threat, thanks to her defeating Tamari before. Hinata dodged what she could, even blocking some of the blades with Hinod. Each blade of wind launched made the whirlwind smaller. As it got close to her height the weasel let out a loud sound and the whirlwind dispersed, launching all the blades at her. Hinata was unable to dodge all of them. She coated herself in chakra and began to spin rotation. A dome of chakra appeared and blocked all the blades of wind. She only stopped spinning when all the blades were gone. The weasel disappeared in a puff of smoke. As the weasel summon had been focused on Hinata, Tamari had been forced to try and hold off Samui. Sadly she failed and she was knocked out by a powerful lightning ninjutsu. Moments later Hinata stopped spinning. She saw that Samui had knocked out Tamari and rushed towards her. Her staff clashed with Samui's tanto. Hinata disengaged from the tanto and threw a palm strike at Samui's chest. Samui weaved out of the way and slashed at Hinata's stomach, her tanto glowing with lightning, but it was blocked by the butt of Hinata's staff. Hinata broke from the clash and spun her staff to knock away the tanto. As she did her fingers lanced out and managed to clip Samui's torso. While she didn't get a chakra point, she still released a pulse of chakra to attack her. Samui twitched in pain, she could feel the chakra burning in her side. It seemed that Yul was using fire chakra for her strikes. She couldn't fight it, but she knew it would burn out after a few minutes. Till then, she would have to deal with the pain. Samui leaped back and quickly rushed through hand signs before taking in a deep breath. Lightning style. False darkness. With those words she shot a lightning spear from her mouth at Hinata. Hinata performed a rotation to block the lightning spear. Once she stopped spinning she threw something out her hand, releasing an air palm. Samui dodged the air palm, but didn't notice that it was tossed at the same time until it was almost too late. She managed to dodge the hitting a chakra point, but instead it stuck in her arm and began to burn. She grit her teeth again as she pulled it out. Yol was using fire chakra as well. The two clashed again, Hinata had the much longer reach, while Samui's tanto was quicker. The fight had been going on for close to five minutes. The two were in what appeared to be a stalemate, but Samui knew she was losing. She was tiring quickly, and her movement was already becoming slower. She knew she would make a mistake soon, and when she did the fight would be over. She couldn't even get enough distance to launch some ninjutsu. It was a minute later that it happened. Samui's foot caught on a hole in the ground, the same hole where the sand that had grabbed Shino came from. She fell back unable to regain her balance. Hinata took that moment and lunged forward, as she did her free arm was clad in blue chakra that formed a lion head. Gentle step. Lion fist. Her fist impacted on Samui, the chakra increasing the force of her strike, causing Samui to hit the ground hard and crater the ground. The crater was nowhere near the size of the ones left behind by Lee and Naruto's fight. Hugh jumped into the arena and checked Samui. Both Tamari and Samui are unable to continue, the winner by knockout is Hinata Yul. Page box. A turn to Jiraiya. Well you guessed the final match Jiraiya. Shame we didn't actually bet anything. Jiraiya nodded as he said. Her lion fist is getting more destructive. Aki looked at Jiraiya. I have never seen that technique before, what in the world was it? Jiraiya chuckled. 
I can't go too deep into detail, but basically it's a fusion of Hinata's fighting style with Tsunade's super strength technique. Sadly according to her, she's nowhere near finished with it. Tsunade's certain that Hinata will surpass her. Aki looked towards the arena with a smile. I look forward to seeing the final match. In the arena. Naruto and Hinata were both in the arena facing each other. Q looked at the two as he said. Are both fighters ready? Naruto nodded. I am ready. I am as well. He raised his hand. Then let the final battle of the exams begin. Naruto and Hinata both looked at each other. The two stared for a few seconds, causing the tension to build in the audience. That's when they made their move, it was time to end the exams. Rock, paper, scissors. Everyone in the stadium fell flat on their face. The only ones still standing were Kakashi, Guy, Kurinai, Jiraiya, A, and Tsunade. In the cage box. I was laughing his ass off as the guards and Baki slowly climbed back up from the ground. Jiraiya, I like that student of yours. Jiraiya nodded, barely managing to stop laughing as he said. I wasn't really expecting a fight between the two. But I wasn't expecting them to decide to fight like this. The grinned as he said. Well, I guess we can say for certain that Naruto is an Uzumaki clan member. I bet his ancestors are laughing themselves senseless in the pure land. Although I have a feeling Hinata's ancestors are probably spinning in their graves. Jiraiya grinned. You would be surprised. Hinata's mother was known for the fact she helped Kishina with a few of her pranks back in the day. Aki climbed back into his seat. Well, that is quite the memorable way to end an exam finals. Jiraiya nodded. Yep, those two are definitely going to be. But the Kano had Jen and and. The Kashi was chuckling, while Mike Guy was standing up yelling about the youthfulness of this conclusion. Kurinai was trying her hardest to stop giggling, but she was having a hard time. Asuma climbed back into his seat before looking at Kurinai. You and Kakashi knew about this beforehand, didn't you? Kurinai nodded. Apparently Naruto and Hinata both decided if they ended up facing each other in the finals, they would choose the winner that way. Kakashi nodded with an eye smile. It was actually Naruto's idea. Hinata went along with it because she thought it would be funny. In the arena. Hugh was confused, but he spoke slowly. Um, well it seems that Naruto Uzumaki is the winner of the exam finals. Naruto didn't hear him. Naruto was too busy laughing his ass off. Hinata was giggling as well. They hadn't expected this to work quite so well. Amic, Naruto's first team mission is a. Naruto had returned from the exams a week ago. Four genin had been promoted, Hinata, Niji, Rock Lee, and himself. Over the past week Naruto had helped to teach students in the academy like before. But today was the student's day off and he had special plans for today. He was meeting the Konohamaru Corps at the training ground he had taught them tree walking at. Today will be a very fun day. Naruto got a surprise when he arrived at the training ground. He was expecting three kids waiting there for him. But instead he had found four of them. Hanabi had apparently come along with the Konohamaru Corps to join in on their stealth lesson. Naruto to be completely honest, quite like Hanabi, she was like the little sister he never had. With Hiashi cracking down on the clan elders after Hinata's banishment, the girl was allowed to act like a kid again. She was also often seen in the company of Konohamaru, who both Naruto and Hinata were sure she had a massive crush on. She had even given him a nickname, Kono-kun. Naruto smiled at the four. Well I wasn't expecting to see you here Hanabi. The young girl blushed before she said. I heard Kono-kun talking about meeting you for a stealth lesson. I asked to come along because I wanted to learn as well. All shinobi in the village agreed, most grudgingly, that Naruto was the undisputed master of stealth in the village. Even the Hayuga had trouble finding him at times. This was back when he wore bright orange. Ever since changing his attire, Naruto had reached a whole new level of stealth. The few pranks that had happened in the village since he became a genin were suspected of being committed by him, but no one could find proof. Naruto shrugged as he said. I don't mind, but just so you know, this stealth lesson, your dad might not exactly approve of it. Naruto's idea of a stealth lesson involved pranking the people of Konoha. I don't mind, I want to get better at stealth. Naruto grinned as he said. Well then I guess we better start. With those words he pulled out six scrolls and placed them on the training log that was beside him. So as Konohamaru can tell you, most of these stealth lessons are trials by fire. I give you the basic knowledge you need, then you each will follow the instructions in the scroll. And those scrolls contain your pranking targets. Don't worry Hanabi, I will help you with your target since this is your first lesson. Now pick your scroll. He gestured to the six scrolls he had set out in front of them. They each picked one of the scrolls, and Naruto sealed away the other two. They were all prepared beforehand and he had close to twenty left. As the students pulled out the instruction scroll from their dossier, Naruto unsealed the advanced scrolls from them. These were his stealth missions to help keep himself in shape. He wasn't going to let his students have all the fun. 
the Konohimaru squad all grinned after reading their targets, while Hanabi was surprised to see the target she had picked. Konohimaru had drawn the Siratobi clan compound. Mogi had gotten the academy. Yudin had drawn the Nara clan ranch. While Hanabi had drawn the public library, the civilian library, not the shinobi one. Naruto's own missions made him grin. The four advanced stealth missions were hitting the Hayuga compound, the shinobi library, the tower, and the base. Today would be very fun. Are you all ready? They all nodded as they closed up their scrolls. Good, Hanabi, I will be helping you with your mission, since this is your first lesson. Now we will strike tonight, does everyone understand? The village of Kanoha was in chaos, various clans had been hit by pranks in the middle of the night, along with multiple other buildings. In total eight places had been hit. The Saratobi clan had woken up to find their compound now surrounded by cardboard cutouts of tropical trees with bananas hanging from them. All the male Saratobi clan members, except Kanohamaru, had been dressed as monkeys. Asuma found himself dressed as a silverback gorilla and his cigarette replaced by fakes that released bubbles when smoked. Aruka had arrived at the academy to find it had been painted an eye-burning orange and all the windows had been covered by wood that was painted a bubblegum pink. It was quite horrifying to look at. But the inside was even worse, each room had been changed in a different way, some looked like jungles, others looked like a beach. There was even one that looked like a prison. The Naras woke up and found their home was painted floor to ceiling and wall to wall with abstract art that was so random that Vincent Van Gogh would have gotten vertigo looking at it all. They couldn't help themselves but to look for patterns and soon were screaming out running or literally getting sick on the floor just looking at the paintwork. It was horrific and the clan head Nara Shikaku did the only thing he could do. He ordered every member of the Nara household out to buy paint and brushes to cover this abomination. Sadly for them, someone had destroyed all the cans of paint in every store. This would lead to the Nara clan being forced to camp outside in tents for a week. The civilian library had been painted to look like a blue birthday cake. The pipes on top of said building now looked like candles. Over the entrance of the library were the words Eat Me. Painted in big white letters. This message was added by Naruto after the fact. The Hyuga clan adults had woken up to find sunglasses stuck to their face and a white cane stuck to their hands. To make matters worse, all the adult members had their undergarments changed. The men had women's undergarments in their drawers, while the women had men's undergarments in theirs. This led to quite a few accusations of perversion in the Hyuga clan that morning. The children of the clan were unhit and were able to watch the chaos in peace. The shinobi library had been repainted to look like a ship. Naruto had also somehow managed to get some flagpoles on top of it and turned them into sails. Over the entrance was the figurehead, that of what looked like a sunflower mixed with a lion. Tenten and Niji when they saw this both screamed and ran, suffering from PTSD-type flashbacks. The Hokage Tower had been repainted to look like black stone, with red lines going along it. On top of it was a weird red painted cardboard cutout that looked like a flaming eye with a slit pupil that actually seemed to look around. Tower of Mortar from Lord of the Rings, complete with Eye of Sauron, Jiraiya, had been suffering from a hangover from drinking with Sanadi the night before. He had woken up in bed with her as well. When he saw the new tower he actually approved of it and quickly gave the order to leave it alone for the next couple months. All these pranks had been done through special seals that Naruto had made each of which were on special chakra paper that allowed them to be applied to said location with ease. These seals had the side effect of making the pranks harder to clean up. But the ones who suffered the most were the. Naruto had snuck in and with the help of his clones, had placed special seals on all the masks he could find. Even some that were being worn by that were active at the moment. Shortly after the other pranks were causing chaos, all members were engulfed in smoke. When it cleared they all found themselves in cosplay of characters from various manga, books, and movies, while their masks had changed into face masks of said characters. There were also quite a few different yakai thrown into the mix. Shortly after this happened, the village of Konoha was treated to a sight they hadn't seen in a while. Naruto being chased by Anbu. This sight was sadly ruined by the fact the eight agents currently chasing him were in various cosplay. As Naruto ran away, screaming about being chased by weirdos, he was being followed by four women and four men. The male cosplayers included Natsu Dragneel, Fairy Tail, Coco, Toriko, the Bobo Bobo, not even going to bother writing out the series name, you all know it, and Irin Yeager, Attack on Titan. The Irin Yeager was sadly being affected by the fact the vertical maneuvering equipment actually seemed to work and would at random fire out an anchor, stalling Anbu's chase. The women's costumes were getting in the way just as much as the men. One of them was dressed as Marahan Strauss, Fairy Tail, she was forced to hold up her dress as she ran and hopped across roofs after Naruto. The second was dressed as Patty Thompson, Soul Eater, the third was dressed as a Kitsune, sadly for her, her cosplay was one of the most revealing with a low-cut kimono and the holes cut in the back for the actual moving tails. 
the final female was a generic elf from fantasy stories, sadly for her, a bow and quiver of arrows had been included and was attached to her hands and back with industrial strength super glue. As they chased Naruto he would flip and jump from rooftop to rooftop, keeping a hand on his hat, the grin on his face hidden behind his scarf. He was the only suspect, and he would deny it no matter what, and thanks to Kurama, Yamanaka techniques and truth serum were useless against him. You'll never take me alive. With those words Naruto flipped off a roof down to the ground below, only to be ambushed by a group of, all dressed as clowns or in spandex suits. Everyone outside the alley was treated to the sound of Naruto's protests. A-H-H-H-H. Come on guys, be reasonable. It was just a joke. Ow. You red-nosed motherfucker. Just because you were picked on in the academy doesn't give you the right to be a prick. I have rights, you know, I have the right to a lawyer. Resisting arrest. Are you crazy? I thought you had to be fit to be in, maybe you should cut down on the dango. You want to resist arrest? I'll show you resisting arrest. Let me go you masked perverts. Handcuffs. Kinky, I didn't think anyone beside Anko was into that. Wait. What the fuck is the rubber glove for? I refuse to let you bastards give me another cavity search. Bad down, no dango for you. After this scene Naruto would spend 10 hours in interrogation, where not even Ibiki would be able to make him admit to doing the pranks. It was just another day in Kanoha. Chapter 9. Interlude 1, Unknown Forces Begin to Mov. In a massive library stood Kyleth. In front of him was a podium with a book and a pen writing in it. So it is the beginning. The cycle that has been going on for centuries is beginning once again. Who will come out on top, order or chaos? But will he be able to beat the forces of chaos? That world is a nexus, so it limits what I can do. But I will do what I can. Kyleth walked away and vanished, when he reappeared he was on the other side of the library in front of an ornate door. As he grasped the door he said. Vladimir's domain. When the door opened it revealed a beautiful three-story house with lots of land surrounding it. The house was surrounded by a field of flowers with woods beyond that. Vladimir walked through the door, revealing that the door was opening in the air. He slowly walked along the path towards the house. As he arrived the door opened to reveal a beautiful young woman with long blonde hair done up in a ponytail that reached down to her legs with bangs framing her face. Her eyes were like gold coins that gleamed in the light. She was wearing a revealing yellow kimono, a golden obi, and a black pelt, with gold skulls and lines printed on it. The kimono was open at the shoulders to reveal her large breasts. Behind her waved nine golden fox tails and on her head is a pair of fluffy golden fox ears Ah Kyleth, did you need my husband for something? Or have you just come to visit? Kyleth smiled as he said. I need to speak to Vladimir about a job. Mind leading me to him, Yasaka. Yasaka gave Kyleth a gentle smile as she said. Of course Kyleth. Isaka led Kyleth to Vladimir's workshop. When they arrived she knocked on the door and waited for Vladimir to call them in. When the door opened it revealed a young-looking man with a lean build, skinned as pale as snow and long black hair that was done up in a three-strand braid that fell down his back. He was wearing a black long sleeve shirt with a matching vest over it, black pants and black combat boots. In his hands was a small knife that he was carving wood with. He looked up to reveal an effeminate face with the eyes hidden behind black sunglasses. The man smiled at Kyleth as he said with a whispery voice. Well hello there Kyleth, to what do I owe the pleasure? I have a job for you Vladimir. An unknown location. Agaromo floated in his domain, watching over the elemental nations. He was troubled, the reason for his trouble. Indra's latest incarnation was becoming darker and more corrupt than ever. He knew he couldn't support his eldest son, but he couldn't bring himself to abandon him either. But something was different about his chakra. It was almost as if it wasn't all there. It was at that moment he sensed it. A spark of what felt like his son's chakra. It felt like his son's chakra from before he became corrupted and it wasn't coming from Sasuke. Agaromo quickly located the chakra signature and found the one who was giving it off. It was Itachi Uchiha, Sasuke's older brother. H.O.W. is Indra's chakra in both of them. Not to mention, why is Itachi uncorrupted? Agaromo focused on Itachi, he would need to watch this young man. He was the key to everything, Agaromo could tell that much. Anoha Shinobi Academy. Naruto grinned as he helped Iruka keep the class in check. It had been the month since he had become a and a week since his celebration pranking spree. There were still places that were decorated in unique ways, namely the civilian library, the tower, and some of the academy rooms. It was funny that no one realized that Naruto had helped with the pranking spree. Half of them had been done by the Konohamaru Corporation and Hanabi. Ibiki was twitching and muttering by the end of his interrogation. Naruto took pride in his ability to keep secrets. A couple days ago there had been an incident where Jiraiya had been chased around the village by Tsunade. It soon came out that apparently Tsunade was now pregnant, even though she was over 50 years old. So the village had something to celebrate about. 
Currently, Naruto was leaning against the wall, his face shadowed by his hat. As he learned there, Iruka was giving a lecture on summons. There are four types of summons, first are the low-level summons. Now these are summoned clans without the ability to aid in combat, instead they have various other ways of being useful. Next are the medium-level summons, these have some combat potential, but they are mainly used for other purposes. The second to last are the high-level summons, many of these are family-related and have high-level combat potential. The final are the legendary summons, these clans have summons powerful enough to hold their own against the Biju. Now who can name some summoned clans? Konohimaru raised his hand. My clan has a contract with the monkey summons. But Konohimaru, the monkey contract is a high-level contract. The monkey clan also has the unique ability to transform into a weapon for their partner to use. Can anyone else name another? A young boy in the back who had black hair raised his hand. Don't they have the toad contract? Aruka smiled as he said. Yes he does indeed Ryoga. The toads are one of the legendary contracts. The boss Gamabunta actually held down the Kaiubi during its attack 14 years ago. Can anyone else name a summon clan? Uden raised his hand. Doesn't the boss have a dragon contract? He summoned one during the invasion. Aruka nodded. Yes he does, Uden, I'm surprised no one brought this up earlier. I let Naruto take over talking about his contract. Naruto stepped forward, pushing his hat up so the class could see his eyes. So as Yudin brought up, I have signed the contract with the Dragon Clan. This clan is one of the legendary class ones and a very high-ranking member of that class. The Dragon Clan has been partnered with the Yuzumaki Clan since it was founded. In fact, the army that attacked Yuzushio was completely destroyed by the boss of the Dragon Clan, Slifer. Sadly Slifer was summoned to save the Yuzushio army. Instead he was summoned to avenge my clan. An army of over 10,000 ceased to exist in seconds. Naruto looked at the class who were staring at him with shock. Naruto smiled as he said. According to Slifer, he isn't the only summon with that level of power. According to him there are four in all. He never told me their names, but he did tell me their titles. Slifer is the ruler of the heavens. The next is the king of the golden earth. The third is lord of the northern wilds. The final one is known as the monarch of everlasting night. It was Aruka who asked the question. Do you know which clan they are aligned with? Naruto shook his head. Slifer said that the four of them had an agreement. They would never reveal more than their titles to anyone who doesn't already know about them. He did mention though that only his and the Monarch of Everlasting Knights clan contracts had been signed. Naruto turned to the class. So, who wants to meet a summon? The class erupted into cheers. Iruka, I'm taking the class outside to introduce them to a summon. Before Iruka could answer, Naruto and his clones had already led the class out of the room. It took him a moment to realize what happened before he followed them out. When they were out in the yard Naruto turned to face the class. Now since Aruka had told me about this class a week in advance, I decided that I would get permission from a certain dragon for me to summon him. Now watch closely, first you bite your thumb to get some blood, then you use these hand signs for the summoning. Naruto bit his thumb and began to go through the hand signs before slamming his hand down on the ground. Summoning Jutsu. The kanji appeared on the ground and with a plume of smoke the dragon arrived. When the plume cleared, it revealed a dragon that was on all fours. The dragon had tan scales with a pair of horns on its head. On its chin was what looked like a white beard. The dragon was about the size of a horse. The dragon's eyes were blue and seemed to twinkle. The dragon released smoke from its nostrils before it said. Ah, Naruto my boy. I was wondering when you would summon me. So these are the hatchlings you wanted to introduce me to. Yeah Wolfric, this is the class I teach alongside Aruka. Everyone, this is Wolfric, the smoke dragon. The boy raised his hand. Why is he called the smoke dragon? The dragon's eyes seemed to twinkle more before his body turned into a smoky version of his body. The dragon's deep voice echoed from the smoke cloud. Oh I don't know. Why would I be called the smoke dragon? The dragon's form changed back into a solid form. The student blushed as he said. Sorry about that, wolfric -san. The dragon shook his head. No need to apologize. Curiosity is not a bad thing and neither is the desire to learn. Are there any more questions? Mogi raised her hand. How old are you wolfric -san? The dragon rested his head on his claws as he said. Well I am the second eldest of the dragon clan. I have lived for close to 8000 years. The only one who is older than I is Slifer. But since Slifer is immortal he will watch over the dragon clan till the end of time. Well I will eventually move on to the next great adventure. Hinohimaru raised his hand. Who was your favorite summoner of the dragon clan? Wolfric tapped his claw on the ground before he said. Hmm, that is a difficult one. I will go with Mito Yuzumaki, she is a wise woman and she would summon me just to chat at times. We would have the most intriguing conversations. I was sad to learn that she had passed on. 
I am certain she is enjoying her afterlife with her husband. It was Yudin that asked a question this time. Did she ever summon you for a battle? Yes indeed she did. During the battle against Madara Che. I was summoned for her battle against the Kaiubi. Anabi couldn't help but ask the question they were all thinking. But you're not very big. Wolfric seemed to smile at the young Hyuga. That is true, but you see I can change my size unlike many of the other dragons. I became bigger to fight Kaiubi. My smoke form made it difficult for Kaiubi to fight me. In Naruto's mind Kurama snorted. Wolfric was downplaying the battle. His smoke form was an annoyance to try and fight. He would phase through all his attacks and launch counter-attacks right after. Wolfric yawned. I think my time is up, my boy. I'm not as spry as I used to be. Naruto chuckled as he said. Have a nice day Wolfric. With a nod Wolfric disappeared in a plume of smoke. Naruto turned to the class as he said. Wolfric is a nice dragon, but he gets tired easily. Naruka spoke up. Well now that part of the lesson is over. It's time for the daily sparring, and look, we just happened to be in the yard. The class cheered, they all preferred the physical training over Aruka's boring lectures. It's why Naruto was so liked as a teacher, because when he gave lectures he made sure they weren't boring. At night. Naruto was laying in bed asleep. Behind him, using him as a human plushie was Hinata who had moved in with him right after she became a. Meanwhile in his dreams Naruto was sitting in his mindscape talking with Kurama. So Wolfric actually did really well against you? That damn dragon was without a doubt one of the most annoying enemies I have ever faced. Shukaku probably would have had an easier time against that damn lizard. Unnoticed by the two, a small ein with a hook was slowly being lowered behind Naruto. When it was behind Naruto it moved forward and caught on the back of his pajamas. Naruto continued talking to Kurama, unaware of what was going on. So you admit that there are things Shukaku is better at than you at. Before Kurama could answer, the hook had gotten a good grip on Naruto's clothes. At that moment the line yanked and Naruto was pulled up screaming the whole way. Kurama just watched the mental representation of his host get pulled through the ceiling. It was at that point that Yami who had been sitting next to the cell said. Do you think he's going to be okay? The ancient fox looked at the ceiling before resting his head on his hands. He'll be fine. I'm going to sleep. Okay, see you later, fuzzy. I'm not fuzzy. Unknown location. Ilith was reclining in a fisherman's chair in the library. In front of him was a hole in the floor. On his head was a fishing hat with various lures, while in his hands was a fishing pole. He was currently reeling it in. I caught a big one. A few seconds later he had finished reeling in his catch, which was revealed to be Naruto, who was looking extremely windswept. His pajamas were covered in various debris and had cuts and tears all along it. Naruto was just hanging from the hook, only semi-conscious. Ilith waved his hand, repairing and cleaning Naruto's pajamas, before moving him over to a chair. Naruto sat there semi-conscious and drooling for a couple minutes before he awoke with a start. Where am I? What happened? Last thing I remember was being yanked into the sky. Ilith, who had already hit his fishing rod and chair, along with fixing the hole in the floor, spoke up. Ah you're awake Naruto. I'm sorry about the rough treatment. But I needed to get you here quickly. It felt like the time my prank with the fishing rod went off early and I got caught with it. It was at that moment that Naruto noticed that Kyleth was still wearing the fishing hat. You didn't actually use a fishing rod did you? Kyleth looked at him with a completely straight face as he said. I admit to nothing. Who are you anyway? Not to mention where are we? Kyleth leaned forward, the hat disappearing as he did. My name is Kyleth, the Celestial Dragon. I am the manager of the multiverse, or in simpler terms, I am a god. Where you currently are, is my domain, the Celestial Library. Naruto looked at Kyleth for a few seconds before he said. Okay, first off I'm not kneeling for you. You lost that privilege the moment you brought me here with a fishing rod. Why am I here then? You see Naruto, my job with the multiverse is to try and stop the spread of the forces of chaos. You see chaos spreads by killing the core of a world, also known as a hero. By doing this they corrupt the world and turn it into a factory to make more warriors. They are currently targeting your world Naruto, and you're the hero. So you called me here to warn me? Yes, sadly that is all I really can do right now. You see your world is rather unique, thus I can't interfere too much. All I can really do is warn you ahead of time, answer a single question, and give you some advice. Naruto sat in the chair for a few minutes, thinking of what he should ask. He wanted to ask something that would help. That's when he thought of a question. What techniques would be most useful against the chaos forces? Ilith grinned. That is the right question for Naruto. First, the Hiroshin will definitely come in handy. Another very useful skill will be Sage Mode. But the dragons need to offer you it first. Also, try adding elemental chakra to the Rasengan, but when you do, use shadow clones. Finally, your avatar will be the most useful, but the time you can use that is still a bit off. 
Naruto sat back, the information Kyloth gave him was useful. He had planned to learn the Horatian, along with training with his avatar, once he got strong enough. Sage mode and elemental Rasengan was something he hadn't thought of. Kyloth leaned forward. Now, some advice for you. When you face the forces of chaos, do not hesitate, cut them down. Do not show them mercy, as they will not show you any. Naruto shook his head. One thing you learn about while being a shinobi is to show mercy during battle will just get you killed. Good to know. Now it's time to send you back. Kyloth grabbed his fishing rod. Hold still. Naruto looked at him in confusion. Is it possible for you to, I don't know, snap me back in place? Oh, but this is more fun. Not for me. Fine, spoil sport. With those words Kyla snapped his fingers and Naruto disappeared. Somewhere in the elemental nations. In a forest in the elemental nations, a small tear seemed to appear in the air. After a few seconds it started to expand before a black opening appeared in the air. It was as if it had been made of darkness itself. Out of it stepped four people. The first was wearing hooded robes made of black fabric, with the hood down, revealing his tanned face and purple hair that stuck up in every direction. He had glowing purple eyes and a wide deranged grin on his face. The next one was a woman with pale face and white hair that went down to her back. Her eyes were blue and unlike her companion, she was calm. She was wearing a tight blue kimono that revealed her curves. The third was a young man with a black hair and black eyes that looked completely dead. He was wearing a black long sleeve shirt and black pants with black gloves. The only flesh of his that was exposed was his pale white face. The final one was a woman who had blood red hair and green eyes. Her face was set in a permanent scowl. She was the one who spoke. So this world is our target huh? The white haired woman said in a monotone voice. Yes, our target is Naruto Uzumaki. But because of the rules of the world, we are unable to kill him for three more years. The purple haired man let out an insane laugh. It doesn't mean we can't fuck with him till then. Let me do it, please, I rarely get to fuck with heroes. The red-haired woman nodded. Fine, Kaioki, you'll be our first strike. Takutsu, I need you to find a way into the Akatsuki organization. They'll be very important in the long haul. Shy, I need you to begin to set up the preparation for the plan. The Takutsu spoke up. Understood Akari. The black-haired man nodded as he said in a dead voice. Yes, Akari. The man named Kaioki laughed as he said. Sounds like a plan bossman. Then let's begin. This world shall become the latest territory of chaos. But those words the three vanished. Little did they know they were being watched by a figure cloaked in shadows. So they have begun to make their move. I need to inform him, then I will watch. The figure faded into the shadows slowly. Chapter 10. Interlude 2, The First Signs of Chaos. It has been two years since the exams in Kumo. Naruto and Hinata were both 16, and they are both now. A lot has happened in those two years. Hinata and Naruto had become a team and went on multiple missions, sometimes Kakashi would join. Eight months after the incident with Tsunade chasing Jiraiya, she had given birth to their daughter. A girl with straight white hair and light brown eyes. They had named her Mido and named Naruto her godfather, Hinata was named the godmother. A couple months afterwards, Jiraiya and Tsunade had gotten married. Shortly afterwards, the Icha Icha Paradise books were finished. Jiraiya then tried writing an adventure novel again. Oddly enough it was more popular than the Icha Icha Paradise books. Naruto had still yet to figure out what his avatar actually did. He was waiting for Kurama to say it was safe to use. Kurama said he should be able to use it by his 17th birthday. Last year after his 15th birthday, Naruto was given the seal for Kurama's seal. He promptly opened it to let Kurama out. But Kurama couldn't share chakra with him in the purest state because Yami still existed. Yami would exist till Naruto could reach a location that had the special meditation area necessary for them to fuse. It was something needed for all Jinchuruki that wished to work with their Biju as friends. This had actually led to a very interesting encounter. He had learned of one of the safety features left by his father. Flashback last year. Naruto looked at the cage holding his friend Kurama as he said. Are you ready for Kurama? Yes, now open this cage, I want to stretch my legs a bit. It's cramped here. Barry reached up to grab the seal to pull it away to reveal the lock. When a hand grabbed his arm and pulled him away. Whoa there Naruto, wait a minute. Naruto turned to see the fourth Hokage standing there holding his arm. Naruto did something that he had been wanting to do for a while. He punched Minato Namikas in the gut hard enough to force the man to bend. When he removed his fist Minato ended up puking on the ground. During that time Naruto undid the seal and Kurama stood up to stretch thanks kid, we'll work on controlling my chakra later. Have a nice talk with your dad. Naruto turned to Minato who was slowly standing up. What was that for? Naruto shrugged. It was payback for sealing a giant nine-tailed fox in my gut when I was born. As much as I like Kurama, he's still not a very good birthday present. 
Fuck you, I am goddamn adorable. The two ignored Kurama as Minato rubbed the back of his head sheepishly. Okay, fair enough. I won't deny I kind of deserved that. So how are you here anyway? When I made the seal, I put two safeguards in it. One to summon me when the seal was coming undone. It's kind of useless in its original form since you and Kurama are friends. But at least I get to see the man my son has become. I got to look at some of your memories after you punched me, you ended up just like Kishina. She was right, I guess she proved that you never doubt a mother's instincts. How long will you be here? Since I didn't have to fix the seal, it took 30 minutes. How about we talk for a bit? I want to get to know my son. Present day, in training ground 42. That time spent talking with Minato had been heaven for Naruto. He was so happy to talk to his father. Not to mention Minato had mentioned that he would get to meet Kishina when he started undergoing the process to become a perfect Jinchuruki. Nisruto couldn't wait to meet his mother. Currently Naruto was standing in the training ground, surrounded by throwing knives embedded all around him. In the ground, the tree trunks, one was even embedded in a boulder nearby. Each throwing knife was covered in intricate kanji that formed a whirlpool in the center of the blade. Naruto has grown taller over the past two years. He was now 175 centimeters. His attire was mostly unchanged, except for the addition of a pair of black wristbands. Shinjetsu's bracelet was placed slightly above the wristbands. The sentient sword had been asleep for the past month. Naruto would be worried about it if Shinjetsu hadn't warned him that he would occasionally nap for long periods of time. Naruto had finally reached a level where he could make the seals for the Hiroshin. But just making the seals and being able to use them weren't the only requirements for this. The Hiroshin worked through a connection of the seal placed on Naruto's chest. This connects to the seals that are active, building a space bridge between the two locations. The seal then converts Naruto's body into light, sending him through the bridge. He reforms on the other side, thus creating a green flash. The flash color is decided by his strongest chakra nature, in this case green for wind. In this story, Minato's strongest chakra nature was lightning, thus the yellow flash. The process is instantaneous. But they had a major downside, the fact it puts massive strain on the body. Transforming into light to pass through the space bridge damages the body. To be able to use the technique on the level of what Naruto's father did during the Second Shinobi War, he would have to build up resistance to the damage. Thus making his body tougher. Thus the setup in the training ground. Naruto stood in place, his eyes were closed as he channeled his chakra through the seal on his chest. As he did he could sense each one of the counterpart seals. But the flash of green Naruto vanished and reappeared on one of the tree trunks, instinctively using chakra to cling to the trunk, he picked up the knife and sealed it away, with his eyes still closed. With another flash he disappeared and appeared in the field. He kept flashing around the training ground, each time he did he collected the throwing knife he appeared at before flashing away. This went on 12 times in total before he had to stop. Naruto fell to the ground, less than half the throwing knives had been collected. His body was aching, the damage done by the jumps was painful. But it would be worth it in the end. Naruto tapped the seal on one of his pouches, and all the knives flashed before being pulled into the pouch. He leaned back and looked up at the sky. As he did, something flashed through his mind. His meeting with Kyleth. Karama, do you think we will be ready? Kit, I'm not sure if we will be. But we will have to be as ready as we possibly can be. Not only will we have to deal with these chaos forces, but we have the Akatsuki. There is no time for doubt. You need to face forward and keep moving. You and your mate have gotten pretty strong over the past two years. Thanks Kurama, how strong would you say we are? A rank, no doubt about that. If all goes well, you two should enter S rank by the end of the year. But you'll have a lot of training to reach the level of Itachi. That's good to know. Damn my body hurts. Naruto pulled out a pocket watch and checked the time. After he put it away he slowly stood up and started walking out of the training ground. He wouldn't be able to do any more training for today. Hinata was still on her shift at the hospital. So he was going to get some ramen. Two days later, office. Naruto stood in the Hokage office with Hinata and Kakashi. In front of them was Jiraiya, whose face was extremely serious. Thank you three for coming. I have a mission I need you three to accept. Kakashi was the one who asked what is the mission of Hokage-sama. Naruto raised his hand. Before that, why is Nico visible? He pointed at the purple haired as he said this. Nico was indeed visible and was standing next to Jiraiya's desk. Jiraiya sighed as he said. Apparently after my shadow clone's last attempt to get out of paperwork, I am required to have a responsible adult here at all times. I'm also not allowed to use shadow clones to do paperwork for two months. Naruto snickered, he had witnessed that event. No one realized that the revolt had been started by one of his shadow clones. It had been an amazing prank. Jiraiya ignored it as he said. Now the mission is extremely important. Last month, a village called Joru went completely silent. 
We sent a team of four to investigate it, but they have disappeared. You three are to investigate what happened to the team, as well as what happened to the village. He tossed Kakashi a scroll as he continued speaking. The information you'll need and some items so you can track them are in this scroll. Are there any questions? They all shook their heads. Jiraiya dismissed them and they left. Kakashi took charge since he was the one with the most experience. Pack for at least two weeks and meet me at the East Gate in two hours. Naruto and Hinata both headed for the Uzumaki compound. As they moved Naruto summoned multiple clones to take care of things, while Hinata sent off one to notify their friends about their mission. As they entered the compound a sound came from the bracelet on Naruto's wrist. It seemed that Shinjetsu was awake. How long have I been asleep? About a month ago, you were out like a light. I'm surprised you woke up already. I was having such a nice dream, I was dreaming of the time Shanks was having a party and he decided to leave me in a barrel full of sake. Before then I didn't even know I could get drunk. Naruto I want a barrel of high quality sake for my birthday. Naruto fasipumed as he entered the house. Shinjetsu, you don't even know your birthday. Not to mention, you're not getting a barrel of high quality sake until I get a swimming pool full of ramen. Oh, why do you have to ruin my happiness? Hinata, Naruto is picking on me. Hinata spoke up. Don't worry Shinjetsu, you woke up just in time to join us on the upcoming mission. Oh what's the mission? Naruto frowned as he said. We're investigating a village that has gone silent and four who vanished investigating it. Sounds interesting, glad I woke up for it. Two hours later. Naruto and Hinata landed at the east gate and looked around. They just had to wait for Kakashi, he would be there soon. A few minutes later there was a puff of smoke and out of it was Kakashi. Sorry, I got lost on the route of life. Naruto grinned. Well at least someone gave you a map. As they signed out of the village Kakashi said. The village of Joru is three hours away by shinobi speeds. When we arrive there should be a good four more hours till sundown. This will give us time to do preliminary investigations and set up camp. Are there any questions? Neither Naruto or Hinata had any questions, so they jumped into the trees and began to travel towards Joru, unaware of what was awaiting them. The village of Joru, three hours later. The three were in the trees studying the village of Joru. It was silent and dark, not a good combination. There were no children laughing, no animals making sounds. There were no sounds you would hear in a village at all. It was unnerving how quiet it was. Naruto frowned. There is no way that a village can be that quiet at three in the afternoon. Hinata deactivated her by Akigen. I can't see into the house. Something is blocking my sight. Maybe we should send in a group of shadow clones to scout the place first. Bakashi nodded. I think that is a good idea for Hinata. We need to at least find out what happened to the village. But that they all made a shadow clone and sent them into the village. They waited on the tree branch to find out what their clones would learn. But the shadow clones. The three shadow clones slowly walked towards the village. Kakashi's clone was buried face first into his book. Naruto's clone was mumbling and muttering rebellious thoughts. All the while Hinata's clone was trying to keep Naruto's clone from rebelling. I will now refer to them by their names, without clones attached. It's too much work otherwise and I'm really lazy. I am original using us as free labor. How dare they treat us like this. Clones have feelings too, you know. Bakashi spoke up, still reading his book. Hear hear. Bakashi-san, you're not helping. Naruto-kun, calm down. I refuse to be called Naruto or clone anymore, my new name is Bob. With original Naruto. Unlike most, Naruto had a slight connection to his shadow clones, thanks to Kurama and Yami. So Naruto was hearing everything his clone was saying. Yami was laughing his ass off. Well Kurama was encouraging the clone's rebellion. Naruto fascipumed as he said. Why did he choose Bob of all names? Yami managed to speak between his laughter. I don't know, but I like that clone style. Can we keep him please? No if he survives whatever is going on in the village, I will personally dispel him. But the clones. Kakashi spoke again. Good choice brother. Hinata looked at Kakashi who had his nose buried in his book as they entered the village. Are you even listening to what we are saying? Hear hear. Hinata fascipumed. He isn't listening. Naruto. Bob. I'm not calling you Bob. It would seem that even Hinata doesn't have infinite patience. As the three explored the abandoned village, they soon realized every building had something in common. There were strange markings on each building that glowed a sickly light when in the shadow. The blonde-haired clone looked around. Bob doesn't like the looks of this. Suddenly a voice rang out. So your name is Bob and you refer to yourself in third person. Is your last name Dolt by any chance? Standing on the roof of the building in front of them was a man wearing a long black robe that completely covered his body with a hood. The hood was down through, revealing his purple hair that stuck up in every direction and his bright glowing purple eyes. His mouth was stretched in a deranged grin. Nice to meet you Bob Dole, my name is Kaioki. 
The Kashi looked up from his book. Do you know what happened to this village? Aoki answered in a sing-song voice. Maybe I do, maybe I don't. Why should I tell you about shadow clones? Bob spoke up. I resent being called a clone, I am my own person. Ayoko's grin widened. I like you. Too bad I'm going to have to carve out your heart and eat it. Everyone froze. Kakashi looked at him and said, you wouldn't happen to worship Jashin would you? I've heard those guys have some weird tastes. Ayoki frowned. Nope, I have nothing to do with that weak god. Oh you know what, it's no fun talking to shadow clones. So I'm going to kill you three now so I can have some fun with the originals. With those words he held out his arm, and a massive scythe appeared in a burst of darkness. The scythe was massive with a black handle easily as tall as him. The blade was blood red, half as long as the handle, and had various runes carved into it. At the base of the scythe handle was a wicked looking blade that looked sharp enough to cut through iron like butter. Kaioki spun it with ease. With an insane cackle he jumped down and swung his scythe down. The three clones jumped away and the scythe impaled into the ground like a hot knife through butter. He pulled his scythe out of the ground just in time to see Kakashi and Hinata's clones dispel, leaving the insane Naruto clone. You're not going to dispel. I refuse to go back to the oppressor. I am not the same as him, so I refuse to dispel till I get fair wages and equal treatment. Gak. That sound was from a knife spouting from his chest before he dispelled. Kaioki nodded as he said. As much as I liked him, I needed him to go. He was really cramping my style. Now to begin the first strike in the beginning of the war. He began to laugh insanely, as he did this, three sets of glowing yellow eyes appeared in the darkness of the houses around him. But the original. Inada and Kakashi blinked when their clone's memories returned. They both turned to look at Naruto, who was still watching the village. A few seconds later he blinked and fascinated. God damn it, my clones are unionizing. Naruto tried to ignore the sounds of Yami and Kurama, laughing their asses off in his mind. Kakashi was looking like he wanted to laugh, while Hinata was patting his back. He sighed before he said. So what is the plan to deal with the insane guy with a giant scythe? The Kashi, who had been looking through the bingo book, said. He's nowhere in the bingo book. In fact the only scythe user in the bingo book is Hayden the Zealot, who oddly enough worships Jashin. Anada who was using her by Akigen shook her head. I can see him, but it's like he has no chakra coils. He also seems to be dancing and singing in the village square. I don't recognize the language. Of Kaioki. Aoki was currently dancing around the village square spinning his scythe and using it for balance, as he sang in English. A full commitment's what I'm thinking of. You wouldn't get this from any other guy. He spun his scythe around as he turned around. Set on a small wall nearby was a small machine set up to speakers playing the music that Kaioki was singing along with. One of the beings in the shadow said. What the hell is he singing now? Another appeared next to him. I don't know, apparently it's popular where he comes from. A third spoke up from across the street. At least he's no longer about the ponies and the friendship and the wrapping up of winter. The first set of eyes said. Our new boss is a very messed up individual. Dean Kakashi. He also has throwing knives. I know this because that's how my clone Bob died. Naruto made air quotes when he said his clone's new name. Kakashi frowned. He doesn't have chakra, but that doesn't mean we should underestimate him. It is very possible he has a seal to hide them, or it's also possible that it is a decoy. Naruto tapped his chin as he said. I could go in and attack him first, before you two sneak in and attack him while he's fighting me. Or I could send in a horde of shadow clones first to buy us time to set up our attack. The Kashi thought about the options before he said. I think the second idea is the best option. How many clones should I make then? Do you think a hundred would be enough? Naruto at this time could make around 600 safely, and each one was able to cast a C-class ninjutsu. His chakra reserves were insane. The Kashi thought for a moment before saying. Go with 200 to be safe. Naruto did the familiar cross-shaped hand sign, and with a large puff of smoke, there were 200 shadow clones. Naruto didn't need to give them an order as they all headed off. Except for one which stood in front of Naruto. What do you need? I demand equal treatment and rights for us clones. Also you are required. Gak. The sound that came out of the clone's mouth was it being shut up by a kunai between the eyes. Why are my clones trying to unionize? I don't treat them that bad, do I? Anata shook her head. Not really, I mean you use them a lot in training and studying. Could it just be Yami messing with you? The snickering in Naruto's mind confirmed Hinata's theory. God damn it Yami, stop trying to make my clones unionize. Hmm, nah. I'm having fun messing with your clones. It gets boring in your head all the time Naruto. Naruto sighed, and Kakashi looked at him. Hinata was right wasn't she? Yes, Yami is making those clones act weird. Apparently he's bored. Kakashi patted Naruto's back. 
don't worry, you'll get your chance to go to Kumo's training island next year. Then you will be completely free of having to deal with Yami. I resent that. Naruto doesn't deal with me, I deal with him. I am his better half after all. PFFT, hahaha. <laughs> Sorry I couldn't keep a straight face. Well then, how about you be quiet then? Fine, I'll be quiet and enjoy the show. Naruto blinked when the first of the Shadow Clone memories came to him. Okay, we need to get in position now. Also, this guy is completely insane. Naruto made a hundred more clones and sent them into the village. After he did the three of them hopped up on the village roofs and began to head into the village stealthily. When they got in place to see the village square, they saw an unexpected sight. Village square, a few minutes ago. Aoki grinned as he looked at the horde of blonde shinobi right in front of him. Mind giving me a moment to set up some epic battle music? The Naruto's all looked at each other and shrugged. The lead said. I don't see why not. Aoki grinned as he messed with a little machine for a few seconds before the sound of guitars began to play. It's welcome to the jungle by guns and roses, his deranged grin grew as he said. Well shall we gentlemen? The clones all charged at him, their swords drawn. Kaioki began to spin his scythe almost faster than the eyes could. As he started to weave and slash his way through the horde he sang along with the music. Welcome to the jungle, we've got fun and games. We got everything you want honey, we know the names. We are the people that can find whatever you may need. If you got the money, honey we got your disease. As he sang he had easily cut through 40 clones. The sheer fierceness of his attack shocked the clones. Not to mention his fighting style made it hard to hit him. Aoki tossed the scythe into the air before he spun around quickly. As he did the knives flew out from his spinning form, easily killing 10 of the shocked clones. Kaioki stopped spinning and caught his side, giving one last spin to slice through five clones that had gotten too close. He let out an insane laugh as he charged forward again, dodging and blocking throwing knives. In this case, the number of clones were actually a disadvantage in this fight. They couldn't make use of it because they would likely hit other clones. Not to mention quite a few of their copied seal knives would cause friendly fire. Less than five minutes into the fight Kai and Kai had destroyed close to a hundred clones. It was at that moment that the music changed. A drum beat began to sound. Kaioki's grin seemed to split his face as he began to sing. Oh it's been getting so hard. Living with the things you do to me. My dreams are getting so strange. I'd like to tell you everything I see. The ballroom blitz by the suite. One of the clones looked at his brother as he said. Are we seriously getting our asses kicked by an insane person who is singing as he hands us our asses? Not to mention we can't even understand what he's singing. Before the second clone could answer they were both cut in half by Kaioki. No talking while I'm playing with you all. With those words he jumped back into the horde, laughing the entire time. Of Team Kakashi. The three of them were looking at what was going on in the village square in shock. Kaioki's fighting style was insane at all. It was so chaotic and all over the place that it shouldn't work. Yet somehow it did. It was almost like he was flipping off reality at times. As sometimes when it looked like he missed, the clone would still dispel. Shinjetsu spoke up from his spot on Naruto's waist. Naruto, that guy isn't using chakra. He's using something completely different. It's actually warping reality a bit every time it's used. It also feels completely disgusting. Erg, thank god I can't absorb energy through my clones. I'm going to warn you, when I absorb the energy he's using, I don't plan to give it to you. That stuff is seriously messed up. I'll just expel it into the air. Any idea what Shinjetsu could be? Honestly, it feels similar to an energy I once felt in a spar between your mother and father. Your dad had just learned the basics of sage mode. It feels really similar, but at the same time the exact opposite of the natural chakra used in sage mode. Naruto flinched when he got the memories of a newly dispelled clone. One that had undergone an unwilling neutering. Okay, what the heck. What happened to Naruto-kun? The latest clone that was dispelled via an unwanted neutering. Kakashi flinched when he said that. Before he did it, the guy just kinda froze and looked off into the distance and said. You see kids, this is why the story is rated M. What in the world does that even mean, what story? There were now less than 50 clones, and they finally had enough room to cast some ninjutsu. The song had changed again and again, and now had an extremely upbeat tune. Tiptoe through the window. By the window, that is where I'll be. Come tiptoe through the tulips with me. I highly doubt I need to put this note here, but I still will. It is Tiny Tim tiptoe through the tulips. As he cut down the final clone he spun to block a blade that was aimed at his back as he grinned. Well well well, it's nice to meet you face to face Naruto Uzumaki. The real one I mean. The two jumped back from each other and Kaioki charged forward. His scythe is a blur, but Naruto blocked or parried each and every single strike without so much as a wound. Oh you're so much more fun to play with than your clones. How do you keep blocking my attacks? Naruto had trained him over the past two years almost religiously. 
He had even spent about two months blindfolded outside of missions with his eyes blindfolded. This had helped his style to evolve. His armament was much stronger now. It could protect him from a hit. Naruto smiled as he said. Do you honestly expect a shinobi to spill his secrets? Aoki tilted his head before saying. Pretty please. With Raymond on top. When he said that, a bowl of Raymond appeared on top of his head, pushing down his purple hair. Naruto looked at the bowl of Raymond for a few seconds before he said. Tempting, I feel like if you weren't an insane murderer who was trying to cut my head off, we would get along like a house on fire. Oh I'm sure we would, especially if you gave into your inclination to chaos Naruto. It's so nice to have the limits on your mind removed. It's so fun being chaotic. Naruto frowned as he said. I see, you're one of the ones Kyleth warned me about two years ago. Maybe I am. Maybe I'm not. Kaioki broke off from the clash before spinning away from his location where a purple chakra lion impacted, creating a crater. You'll never know till it's much too late. Naruto blocked another strike as Kaioki dodged Hino being thrust at his head. He then ducked under a lightning blade strike that came very close to his torso. It was at that moment that Kaioki said. Oh now I see how you're blocking my attacks. Naruto was shocked to hear that, but the next part put him at ease. Your sword absorbs energy huh? That explains how you're blocking my side, even when it's clad in chaos energy. No wonder I can't rewrite my strikes to hit you. Oh well, you know what time it is. He spun his scythe quickly and words appeared above him. Dissection time. It was Kakashi that spoke up. How did you make those words appear? Aoki looked at him as if he was the insane one. What words? Kakashi sighed. Never mind. Aoki grinned. Don't think you two can interrupt my fight by the way. I have some very special friends for you. It was at that moment that three figures came out from the darkness. Their bodies were covered in black and sickly yellow growth all over their bodies. Their eyes glowed the same shade of yellow. It was impossible to see their features through the growth, the only identifying thing they had. All three were wearing Kanoha vests. Bakashi glared at him. What did you do to them? Ayoko's demented giggling stopped just long enough for him to answer. Oh, those three couldn't handle their dose of chaos energy. That's what happens when you can't hold your chaos energy. Of course, it could be because I forced them to accept the chaos energy, but who knows. With those words he attacked Naruto again. Anada and Kakashi stood ready to fight their new enemies. While they were slowly walking towards them. It was obvious they were moving slowly on purpose. Most likely to try and make them underestimate them. The former Chunins rushed the two, moving at speeds equal to that of Might Guy without his weights on. Kakashi dodged two attacks from the two former that targeted him. Hinata had blocked the attack from her opponent with the use of a rotation. Naruto parried another strike and then dropped back into a one-handed handstand as he spun around, kicking the insane man in the face and knocking him back. He flipped back up and lunged forward, his sword glowing. Meteor. Kaioki was forced to dodge out of the way. Bakashi kicked the legs of one of them out from under him and stabbed a kunai between his glowing yellow eyes, seeing them go dark as he did. He then spun around and Spartan kicked the other in the chest, knocking him back. He raced through several hand signs before his hand was engulfed in a blade of blue lightning lightning blade. He rushed forward and his hand pierced through the other Chunin's chest like a hot knife through butter. He pulled his arm out and with a flick removed the blood from his arm. He took a moment to pray for the souls of the two he had been forced to kill. This wasn't the first time he had been forced to kill a comrade who was being controlled. Heck it wasn't even the second time. It was one thing that I was forced to learn. There were techniques that could turn your allies into puppets or weapons. Almost all of these techniques were impossible to break. Some destroyed the victim's free will. Others forcibly locked their personality away. Yet others literally turned their loyalties on their heads. It was the general consensus of all that if they were put under one of these techniques. That they would rather die than kill their former comrades. Anada dodged out of the way of another attack before she spun and struck her in the chest with Hinod. This knocked the back a bit. Hinata took advantage of this to deliver a palm strike to the chest, releasing enough chakra to make his heart explode. As she fell to the ground dead she took a moment to pray for the fallen before turning to go help Naruto. Naruto and Kaioki were engaged in what could only be described as a dance of death. Kaioki's scythe was constantly spinning. The scythe or the blade on the bottom of the handle is always clashing against Shinjetsu. Meanwhile Naruto would use Shinjetsu to parry and block all of Kaioki's attacks, countering with kicks, but only when he had a large enough opening to avoid having a leg cut off. He didn't want to have to test his armament against that scythe. Suddenly Kaioki slammed the blade of his scythe into the ground and flipping onto the handle, spinning on his hand to kick at Naruto, who barely managed to dodge the kick. He then flipped forward, pulling the scythe out of the ground and bringing it down on Naruto who rolled out of the way. It was as Naruto parried a strike from the blade at the bottom of Kaioki that the man was forced to dodge another strike from behind. Hinata and Kakashi had put down their enemies. 
Hinata's face wasn't its usual gentle self. Instead it was now blank, lacking all emotions. She was keeping her emotions under control. She was feeling both angry and guilty from the fact she was forced to kill someone who used to be a comrade. It hadn't hit her till after she had killed them. Aoki giggled as he said. Oh why the long faces. Didn't enjoy my present. Aoki rushed at them with blade slicing through the air. Naruto blocked it, redirecting the energy before blocking the blade fully with Shinjetsu, locking him in place. When he did, Hinata rushed forward, her staff extended to strike him in the chest. Aoki spun around the strike and let out an insane giggle as he let go of his scythe and jumped out of the way of the fireball that was about to hit him. As the scythe fell Naruto held Shinjetsu with both hands as he began to flow his chakra through it. As he did, Shinjetsu began to glow gold. The glow was so bright that it made Shinjetsu's black blade look like it was forged from gold. Naruto looked at Kaioki, the very world around him slowing around as he did. He charged forward at such high speed he became a blur. Rising sun slash. Shinjetsu seemed to grow, soon being three times the size it usually is. Naruto slashed across Kaioko's body, leaving a glowing slash mark which burst and launched Kaioki into a building. As the insane man hit the building he burst into a plume of purple smoke, same with his scythe. That's when laughter sounds from the building behind them. Good job, of course I left the opening for you to strike. You're quite skilled, Naruto. They turned to see the man standing there, leaning on his scythe as he grinned. The slash mark was still visible, revealing that they had been fighting the real one. But the question is will you be ready to face the others in a few months? Hum I don't think you will. Next time we meet I'll make sure to bring some real chaos soldiers. Not those puppets I made with those so-called shinobi. Till next we meet, have fun and always watch out for chickens. With that he burst into a plume of purple smoke and disappeared. Naruto dropped to the ground as he panted. He was dead tired, having to block each of those strikes was insane. Not to mention the rising sun slash along with its counterpart Moonless Kai were two techniques he had only recently finished making. The rising sun slash relied on Yang Chakra, which he had massive amounts of as an Uzumaki clan member. The Moonless Kai relies on Yin Chakra. His body naturally produces lots of Yin Chakra to keep his body balanced thanks to the excess Yang Chakra that comes from being an Uzumaki and having Kurama's Yang half sealed inside him. His goal is to eventually be able to combine the two chakra natures for a truly powerful attack. Akashi, who had sent off two shadow clones to check the homes, turned to his two comrades. We need to get out of here and report to Hokage-sama. What we learned here could be important. If we move quickly enough, we should be able to reach the village before nightfall. Naruto stood up and rubbed Hinata's back. Hinata was staring off into the distance. Well it wasn't her first time killing someone, that was during their exams in Kumo. It was her first time having to kill a compromised comrade, even if they couldn't see their faces. It's okay Hinata-chan. I doubt he would blame you. Come on, let's go home. He kissed her forehead and she gave him a weak smile. Although still bothered by what she was forced to do, she knew she wouldn't be alone. Three hours later, the office. Gureya sat with his hands together, to the side were four shadow clones that were doing paperwork. He was currently thinking about what Team Kakashi had just revealed. It was troubling to say the least. Not only this guy managed to destroy a horde of several hundred of Naruto's clones. He had also held off Naruto, Hinata and Kakashi until he decided to let Naruto hit him. Not to mention how he corrupted them. But what he implied that he wasn't alone in all this. This wasn't good at all. Thank you to the report team Kakashi. You three did a very good job. Before they could reply through the door was thrown open as a race in. Hokage-sama, there's a disturbance at the north gate. The guards there report that five sound shinobi with a young boy are currently heading towards it. One is confirmed as Kabuto Yakushi, and he's almost carrying another man. We believe the other man is injured. Gureya shot up. You three, with me. Anbu Niko, I need you to tell Danzo that Kabuto is here and he is to meet me at the north gate. Let's go to Kakashi. The four rushed out leaving the shadow clones. One of the shadow clones turned to the others as he said. So, want to burn the paperwork? The other three clones quickly agreed. At the northern gates, ten minutes later. Kabuto was holding up Kimimura with the help of Jugo as they, Gurin, Yukimaru, and Karen walked towards the gate. Danzo had assigned Kabuto to spy on Arachimaru, and he had been for the past few years. The three with him were his only remaining allies. The rest of Gurin's team had been killed in the escape from Itagakur. Kabuto had witnessed when Sasuke had killed Arachimaru and absorbed all his knowledge with an obscure technique. He had gathered his team, Karen and Jugo, who had been called back to the main base for experiments, and Gurin's team had fled Itagakur. Sasuke and Sakura who had taken control by then, had sent the Sound 4 after them. They managed to escape with their lives thanks to Gurin's team holding them off. They had managed to lose them, he was certain of it. Don't worry Kimimro, Sanadi will be able to heal your sickness. 
I'm absolutely certain of it. If she can't, she can at least delay it long enough for Naruto-kun to be able to use one of the Uzumaki clan's medical seals to heal it. Gamimuro coughed weakly, blood coming from his mouth. I hope she can do Kaputo. I don't want to leave Jugo alone. I know what it's like to be alone. Then you'll get along with Naruto-kun like a house on fire. From what I heard he knows what it's like to be alone as well. They had reached the gates when Gurin walked towards him and took the arm Kabuto had draped over him. Here I'll help Kimimuro. You talk to the Kanoha shinobi and convince them not to try and kill us. The Buto walked forward, his hands in plain view. When he reached the sealed gate he said. I need to speak to Danzo. I am the root known as Hebe. I have a report on my mission. We are willing to submit ourselves to the T&I department, but our companion Kimimuro is very ill. He needs treatment from Tsunade Senju. A few seconds later, the gate creaked open and out walked Jiraiya, Danzo, and Team Kakashi, with multiple and root agents following behind them. Danzo walked forward as he said. You'll be escorted to T&I Agent Hebe. Once there you will be debriefed. Your friend will be treated as well. The Buto bowed his head. Thank you so much Danzo-sama. Danzo turned to the Enrude as he said. Escort Kabuto and his allies to the T&I department. Also bring Inachi and Ibiki as we will need them to test that they are all who they say they are. The agents escorted the group into the village as Jureya turned to Danzo. Were you expecting your spy to come back so soon Danzo? Danzo shook his head as they headed into the village. When they entered the village the gates closed behind them, being set into night mode as the sun had fully set. No, he wouldn't have come back unless his mission was compromised. But the question is what exactly happened? Gureya nodded. Well we will soon have all the information. I just hope Kabuto doesn't hold a grudge against Naruto for the Rasengan. The next morning, Hokage office. Ibiki had just finished giving his report to Jiraiya and Danzo. Tsunade was currently in T&I trying to heal the young man named Kimimuro. Luckily she said it was possible to treat, as she knew the illness. It was a rather rare illness known as Red Swamp Fever. Luckily a cure had been created recently. Kimimuro would survive, but he would be bed-locked for a few weeks. Ibiki and Inachi had interviewed them extensively, and Inachi had done a mind walk on each of them. They were who they said they were, and they were all loyal to Kanoha. Danzo sighed. This is not very good. Orochimaru is dead and the traitor Ichiha has all his knowledge. At least Kabuto managed to get away with the remainder of his team. Gureya sighed. I'll need to call Itachi back ahead of time. He needs to be treated so he can take care of Sasuke. When he learned about what Sasuke did, he said he had to be the one to kill Sasuke. Danzo nodded. We'll need a place to put Kabuto and his team. Do you think Naruto would mind letting them stay in one of his clan's family houses? That Karen girl is in Yuzumaki. Not to mention Naruto and Hinata can keep an eye on them then. Gureya tapped the desk slowly. It's a good idea. I'll talk to him about that later. I can make it a mission to sweeten the deal. Have you figured out who you're going to assign Itachi to work with? I was thinking Team Kakashi would be perfect. They will be on the front lines against Akatsuki. Good plan Jiraiya. You have Kakashi who is easily the third strongest shinobi currently in the village. Kakashi reached S rank over the past two years, Itachi who knows information on each Akatsuki member and would have become Hiruzen's successor if he hadn't been forced to go into banishment. Hinata is a medic nin and is Tsunade's personal student. She's also a terror in the arts of Tojutsu and, not to mention the long-range Juho. Finally you have Naruto, an Injutsu and hard hitter. He is also well trained in Kenjutsu, Tojutsu. Even though he is one of Akatsuki's targets, it's probably better for him to be on the front lines. Surrounded by powerful comrades and attacking the Akatsuki head-on is always better than being pulled back and being bait for them. Two S-rank shinobi and two A-rank borderline S-rank shinobi, it will be a terrifying team. Has the Rakage agreed to allow Naruto to use the Jinchuruki training grounds yet? He said Naruto can use it once he turns 17. Jiraiya had been working on a letter as they spoke. He finished it and once it was sealed, he summoned a messenger toad. Take this to Itachi Ichiha, make sure he's alone before delivering it. The messenger toad nodded before disappearing in a plume of smoke. Now we need to prepare for his arrival. In four months, the Akatsuki will begin to move. We will be ready for them. Amik, why Hinata is still Yol rather than Hayuga. Alternate title, the day the caged bird seal died. Office, a week after the massive prank. Hinata was in the office with Naruto. In front of them was Hiashi who had an annoyed look on his face. It wasn't from what either of them had done, the elders had become almost unbearable again. Hinata, the elders want me to extend an offer to graciously let you back into the clan as a member of the branch family. Naruto, have you finished the counter seal yet? Naruto gave a feral grin and held up two small scrolls. One was blue and the other was red. I finished it the other night. This one will erase the caged bird seal. He shook the red scroll. This blue one is the new seal for the Hyuga clan. 
I still love how you trick them into agreeing to it. The Ashi returned the grin with one of his own. It's not my fault that the elders don't read what they are signing. His face became more gentle as he said. Are you sure you won't want to rejoin the clan once the seals are in place, Hinata? Hinata smiled gently at her father. I'm absolutely certain about my father. I am a yell now, until the day I marry Naruto and take the Uzumaki name. The Ashi shook his head. She had inherited her mother's stubbornness. Sadly it only showed after she had true support to grow. Well you will always be welcome at the compound. Your sister will be happy when you begin to visit. Two days later. The Ashi was in his office filling out paperwork when his office door was thrown open and the four elders stepped in, including his father, who was barely managing to keep his poker face. Elder Meijo, the only woman among the elders, stepped forward and said. Hiashi sama you must put a stop to it. Your disgrace of a daughter and the demon are unsealing the branch family. They say they have a law-binding contract signed by all of us. But we never signed a contract. The Ashi looked at them with a feral grin as he pulled out his copy of the contract. Oh, but you see esteemed elders. You all did it. Such a shame you didn't bother to read the paperwork you were signing. As you all agreed to let the caged bird seal be destroyed and a new bloodline seal without the despicable pain feature applied to all the Hyuga clan members. Not to mention, you signed all your powers away making you all figureheads leaving all the power in the clan head. Hiashi was glad he had Naruto write up the contracts. There was a reason why no one ever dared to break a contract with an Uzumaki clan. As their contracts were basically loophole-free and if they were broken, well the penalties were horrifying. The elders were speechless. They couldn't believe that with a single signature they had lost all their power. Hiashi's father on the other hand was smiling. I'm glad it worked Hiashi. I'm going to go get my new seal and then enjoy my retirement. With those words he left the room. The elders were too shocked to raise a fuss and left as well. The Ashi grinned as well the door was open he could hear the sound of Hanabi and Hinata talking. He leaned back in his chair as he looked at the ceiling and thought to himself. You know Minato, I bet if you and Kishina were still alive, you would be so happy to know we would be in-laws. I can't wait to see my grandchildren. If they end up awakening the Byakugan, I wonder if Hinata will let me train them in the Junkin. Life was good for the Hyuga clan head. Thanks for listening. I do hope you enjoy it. If you want the next part of this video. Turn on that bell notification. Like subscribe and comment down below. And also check out the others videos. I have created and enjoyed it. See you guys next video.